order. Uh, welcome to this meeting of the Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee. Grassroots music venues is what we're talking about today. They are a major pipeline for our music industry, but they are closing at the rate of more than two a week, and more than one in three is making a loss. So this morning, we're looking at what more we can do to support these incredible venues right across the country. So for our first panel, I'd like to welcome John Collins, the CEO of Live Music Industry Venues and Entertainment, also known as Live, Mark David, the CEO of Music Venue Trust Limited, and John Drury, the chair of the National Arenas Association and vice president and general manager of Wembley Arena. You're all very, very welcome. Before today, we've had two roundtable events with grassroots music venues, which was very kindly organized by the Music Venue Trust. One here in Winchester, uh, well, Winchester, West, sorry, I think it's Steve, <laughs> Brian, who's normally here. One here in Westminster, and then, of course, one much more glamorously in the Night and Day Cafe in Manchester. We just wanted to put on record our thanks to all the live music venues that came along and um, represented themselves so fantastically uh, in those sessions. They've really helped to inform a huge amount of the thinking that we've already done on this uh, piece of work, and indeed who we've invited today to give evidence. Uh, so... Before I start, would any of the members like to declare any particular interests? No? In which case, um, tall, in which case I'm going to kick off the questions. So, um, Mark, <coughs> and Mark and John, I'm going to start um, with a question to you. Last year, the UK lost 125 uh, live music venues. I want to try and get an understanding of the the impact of that. Can you sort of quantify it? What does that mean in terms of the damage to venues, in terms of the pipeline of artists, engineers, uh, in terms of the sort of fabric of communities, Mark? Um, I think we'll probably spend a lot of today talking about the pipeline, but I think the first impact we need to recognise is that is 125 communities that have lost access to live music on their doorstep. And the impact on those communities and on the artists who live in those communities is very dramatic. The closure of a space like Bath Moles obviously has a huge impact on the pipeline, but it also has a massive impact on Bath as a music city. And so I think we need to recognise that across the country we are seeing young people, communities of music fans, finding music, live music, further and further away from them. In terms of the short-term economic impact, those 125 venues will have provided 16% of all the performance opportunities in the UK, so we're talking circa 30,000 performance opportunities for artists. We're talking jobs, roughly 30 people at each venue, so again, something like, well, I think that's about 4,000 jobs have come under threat uh, or have been lost. Um, those are the short-term impacts, and, and very importantly, I think we should recognise 125 venue operators have lost the space that was an intrinsic part of their, their life, their careers, um, and, and we're not sure really what happens to those people and, and what they do next. They have, many of them have spent decades running one of these live music venues. We don't know what they will do now. John, in terms of the longer term impacts, sorry, yeah, no, carry on, carry on. in terms of the longer term <laughs> impacts, we are seeing a, a blockage in the talent pipeline, and I think that is very significant. And I want to thank the committee for the, the guests you've invited to come and speak to you today after those two excellent meetings with venues. And I think you can hear from our sector the concern we have about whether the UK is going to continue to, to bring up the exceptional talent that we've dominated the world with for the last seven decades. You know, we're a huge net exporter of music. Where does that all start? It all starts at a grassroots music venue. Even if your career didn't start there, probably your inspiration, your aspiration started because you lived in a community with music. And if you take that away, we're taking away the ignition engine, the starter motor of our entire music industry. We need to really think about that and plan for the future because we do not have a plan at the moment. <coughs> John Collins, did you have anything to add to that? And um, yeah, Mark obviously has given quite a comprehensive answer there. I think you know, for, for the benefit of the committee who don't know live, we have 16 associations on our board. So we have Mark as MVT, John as NAA, the Arenas Association. And then we have festivals, promoters, producers, through to ticket agents and orchestras and electronic music. So we have a broader 
uh, perspective, I guess, on this. And it mirrors everything Mark says. I think the board have discussed this issue at our last two board meetings and recognise the pressure that grassroots music generally is under. So that's venues very specifically, but then also we've lost 28 festivals this year. You know, artists can't afford to tour. So there is a general pressure at that grassroots level where fundamentally costs are overtaking the revenue side of things. John, I'm going to have to keep calling you by, it's a bit like being in school, I'm going to have to call you by your full name so I get the right John. Um, John, are you, given that sort of breadth of experience that you, you have with your organisations, are you concerned that there's a sort of breadth of genres that UK music has to offer that may be kind of lost as a result of this closure of the festivals, but this particularly what we're talking about today, the, the, the live music venues? Um, yes, I mean, it, it's <coughs> fundamentally, the live music industry is all about taking risk you know, and capacity to take risk, whether that's a career as a musician with all the risk that that holds, Mark's members with their 0.5% profit margin, uh, festivals that are setting ticket prices 12 months before uh, the event happens and then seeing if cost will allow them to have any sort of profit margin. So um, we're, we're always looking at this. How are we able to allow artists, venues, festivals to take risk? And if the pressures continue as they are, then that room for manoeuvre at grassroots just becomes ever more restricted. Thank you. I'm going to move to the other John, Jerry now. Indeed. John, um, at the other end of the scale, I'm, I'm interested to find out what's happening in the world of arenas. So the yeah. figures show that arenas made £1.9 billion pre-COVID, um, excluding tickets. And attendances were record high in 2022. But how did the arenas perform last year? What's the latest information on that? It did dip. The number of live performances dipped by 12% last year, and it hit the level that we were at in around about 2016. But just to sort of paint the picture of the arenas, we're all very different models, I suppose. So there are 24 UK members, all with a capacity of at least 5,000. And it sort of ranges from the smaller end being the Royal Albert Hall, right through to venues like the O2 AO Arena and the New Carp Live in Manchester at the 20,000 plus. But a number of the venues are community arenas, if you like, that don't do a lot of music at all. Um, we find, as, a, as an average, music is 50% of our diary across the arenas. And the range last year went from 18 shows in, uh, as the lowest in one venue to 120. So it is it's quite varied. So I think the focus is on certainly the biggest venues that have the most. We've also got that smaller end. And in all cases, it's 50% of what we do. That said, in terms of the grassroots sector, we fully uh, are on board with the support that we want to give. We've been giving support for a while in different ways, financial and non-financial. And you know, we sort of align with Mark and John on on the messaging uh, for the grassroots because we understand that, that, yeah, that they have the importance of that sector to the industry as a whole because we're an ecosystem mm. and, and Mark your posters yesterday that showed Glastonbury and, Le and Reading uh, with all of the you know, non-grassroots uh, artists taken out I think speaks volumes but also to not the arenas so much as the academy circuit and those venues further down the line that very much will rely on that, <laughs> that grassroots circuit to build their careers. Mm, thank you very much. Giles. I th thank you, Chair. Um, I never thought I'd hear the Royal Albert Hall called a smaller end, but um, <laughs> an amazing venue. Um, yeah, I just wanted to talk uh, about uh, the government, government's uh, intervention. I mean, it, it uh, extended business rate relief. And we'll provide four million uh, via the Arts Council. This really is to Mark. Um, until 2025. How has this helped? Has it made a difference and is it sufficient, Mark? On business rates, um, we're very grateful for the support. 75% business rate relief was actually absolutely essential. Um, roughly that, the full business rate would cost about £20 million in our sector. So obviously 75% relief is a £15 million boost to the sector effectively. There was moves in uh, as late, early as 2019 to look at specifics around grassroots music venues and business rates. Yeah. And in fact, when uh, Rishi Sunak was <coughs> Chancellor, 
number. Um, he introduced a 50% relief specific to grassroots music venues because of the nature of their operation, which is to do with how the business rate is calculated, the kind of space they can use, things called fair maintainable trade, which are different from music venues but aren't actually recognised within the business rate system as it currently is. On the uh, supporting grassroots fund announced by Dep uh, Department of Culture, Media and Sport in July last year, we initially were really enthusiastic about that and we remain very enthusiastic. However, it should be noted that between July and the final definition of what the fund will be used for in October, um, £4 million is the total value of the fund that's being made available to the whole grassroots music ecosystem. Right, and so not sufficient in your view then? Um, I, the demand far out, out strips the, the supply, unfortunately, on that. But it is a great move. We would like to see that fund increased. It's obviously clear that the division distribution of public funding for music in the UK is still very heavily weighted towards what we might describe as the high arts. Um, in the grand scheme of things, £4 million is great for our sector, but realistically it pales in comparison with what we're seeing for public support for other sectors. So and you supply the, the grassroots of the ecosystem that John was talking about, and that is absolutely vital to support that in your view in this way absolutely yes uh, but I, I think I want to come back to I think that in this in this economic climate I think the government is doing some great things to support the grassroots system I'm really very very focused on what the industry itself can do at the moment recognizing that public purse is definitely constrained so how, how did the um, grass uh, music venues respond to the government waiting until the aut autumn statement to uh, announce the extension of rate relief? With panic, <laughs> <laughs> um, as we did as well. I, I, one of the things is these are very personal businesses to the people who operate them. You know, there's a well-known saying in our, in our sector, how do you make a million pounds running a grassroots music venue? Start with two million. <laughs> you know, so these are not businesses in the traditional sense. They are passion projects. You know, more than a quarter of them are now registered as not-for-profit entities. They really are servicing their communities, and so any kind of pressure on them, any any ch challenge they can see coming down the line is extremely stressful for them. So mm. it would have been great to see that extended further in the future, and we're still very keen there should be a review of business rates in this sector. But, um, you, but, but, but the, the, the sector would, would, would like to have heard about it earlier, would like to know yeah, what's correct. coming down the line. 100%. Okay, I think that point's very well made. Um, uh, we know that uh, UK goers have charged 20% VAT, uh, which is, I think, double the UK average, um, or the, the European average. Um, how would you respond if people say, you know, we provided business rate relief and extra funding uh, and record atten attendances at live shows, uh, why should we cut VAT? Um, I think it's a good question. <laughs> um, in our sector, the cut of VAT um, would essentially cut pre -ta what I call pre-profit taxation. Um, these are businesses that, as we can see, are living on a very, very slim uh, profit margin. More than a third of them made a loss in 2023. Um, it would make a small difference, but in that kind of atmosphere, every small difference makes a difference. So a 5 or a 10% cut in VAT would increase that 0.5% profit margin by a small amount. What I would say, though, is... Would it make it sustainable, though? Would it make... It wouldn't quite make it sustainable. The loss that these, these venues are making strictly on the tickets as opposed to their investment in live music is running at £114 million a year. They bring in, uh, I think it's £134 million in ticket money and spend £248 million putting on live music. They make up for the rest of that with alcohol sales or, or food sales. Yeah. What might make a difference, and I'm going to look at my colleague John here, is if there was a VAT cut on tickets, it would certainly give us the space to go to the, the figures in the le leading figures in the music industry and say, listen, now is the time for you to reinvest that in the research and development that's happening at this level, in artists, promoters and venues at the grassroots level. Get these artists out there representing the UK. Uh, guys, uh, John and John, the Johns, mm -hmm. any comments on that? Well, on Mark's point about VAT, the VAT cut, um, I think we would share that view that any any discount that could be taken back into the industry, as long as we know it was going to the right places, would be a good thing. Uh, the arenas last year raised £100 million in VAT for the mm -hmm. Treasury. 60% uh, of that was from tickets. 
and 40% was from ancillary or other income. Interesting point. Is the success of the arenas skewing the case against VAT redu- reduction? Uh, I wouldn't say it is, but I would say that a, a discount in the arena world is not necessarily needed. But to, to, to reroute that back into the, the GMV and yeah. the MVT venues would be, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think there's a, sorry, there's a second dimension to this on you know, the VAT call. There's, there's to ease pressure in the grassroots. And then as the Chancellor identified last year, the creative industries are one of five key growth areas of the economy. Yeah. And he, the, we've been asked, what are the barriers to growth? EU touring and 20% VAT on tickets mm. are the two big barriers to us doing more. And if we were able to do more uh, via a cut in VAT, then for every 10,000 people who attend one of John's venues, they spend a million pounds in the local economy. So we have the opportunity to be a significant catalyst for local economic activity. Um, And just to return to your point about um, business rates, um, we we, we need to know these things in advance. It should be, in my view, it should be made permanent, or if it's going to be extended for three years, tell us now so the businesses can factor that into their planning. Don't keep us waiting till the last moment. Yeah, so you can start getting things together. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Chair. Damien. Thank you, Chair. Um, and good morning, all. <coughs> I think Mark is being realistic when he says he doesn't think um, future chancellors are going to be scouring around for ways of cutting their tax revenue, uh, given the general economic situation. So, cutting to the chase, the other solution you've come up with is the levy. Um, and, and, Mark, you've advocated a levy based on the, the French 3%. Talk us through how that works in practice. Uh, The French model is a 3.5% levy on the gross value of tickets sold. Um, It goes into a central fund administered by the Central National de Musique. Apologies for my terrible French accent. Um, And that fund can then be applied for um, by artists, by promoters and by venues. Um, They apply on the basis of risk-taking. So a venue will typically say, here is a programme of events that is important to the development of French artists or French music and we will need, or we will lose in this six months of this programme, 40,000, 50,000 euros. They draw it down from the fund. At the end of that, it is assessed how much, how it actually economically performed, and they can make an application for the following six months or year on the basis of the money they've lost. That's a similar operation for promoters. The French fund does also support artists to make albums, um, to do recordings, rehearsals, etc., production expenses. Um, the value of the French fund, though, is, is very significant. We believe it's over 200 million euros. Um, I'll be honest, much as I'd love to tell you that we would like 200 million pounds and it would resolve everything very, very quickly, <laughs> realistically, we don't, we don't need that. Our proposal in the UK is one pound per ticket on arena and stadium shows would create a sustainable fund that could be administered by ourselves, by other people concerned for promoters, for artists, and create a fund where everybody can go so they can take risks with their programming and really give artists the first step on the ladder they need. So it's not a fund, this putative fund, just for venues, it's for artists and promoters as well? Correct, yes, and I I think the same applies here. All of my members will tell you one of their biggest concerns, frankly, is that artists cannot afford to tour. The length of tours we're seeing, it's not just that venues aren't there to play in, it's also that venues are standing empty when they could be putting on bands because bands cannot afford to put on the show. And and does it, broadly speaking, work in France? Does France have a healthier grassroots music scene than we do? Um, No, because we have the healthiest grassroots music scene in the world and that's one of the reasons we're one of the three net exporting nations. We have an almost unique organic petri dish of experimentation, of research and development that happens in our communities almost by accident. We're more talented than the French at this time. (laughs) (laughs) Am I allowed to just not answer a question? (laughs) Um, In Parliament. I I think we have a long history of experimentation, of taking cultural risks, of our artists being supported at grassroots level by people who just believe in music in their communities. We're holding this this hearing on on a great day for me. It's the 30th anniversary of the day that Oasis played in my club in Tunbridge Wells, a former toilet we converted 31 years ago to be a venue. Okay, so 
Why did I put Oasis on? I didn't want to put them on. I wanted to put on Whiteout, but the agent assisted, insisted that Oasis should come with them. I was made to put them on. But we put on Whiteout, even not in the expectation we'd sell out, because we really liked their record and we thought they should play in Tunbridge Wells. It's not as considered as, well, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to put on the next artist that's going to headline John's Arena. It's all about taking risks and experimenting, and it's all about our local communities that are prepared to do that on, on the behalf of the music industry. I mean, as we're turning to the other end then, I mean, in, in, you know, John Drury, you're, this is coming off your bottom line or somebody's bottom line that you're associated with. What do you think about this proposal? Yeah, I mean, firstly, I'd like to thank Mark for discovering Oasis. He's <laughs> <laughs> um, um, himself in the legend. Now. <laughs> it's very, very clever. But you're right. If, uh, if this was from our bottom line, and everybody will say they don't want that to happen, and we don't, uh, the reality of a pound a ticket for us given the nature of many of our venues are managed uh, on behalf of private landlords, city councils, charitable trusts, uh, the impact would be something like a 20% cut in our EBITDA. So it's not, it's not a few grains of sand. It's, it's quite significant. And our angle is more that this is a problem for the ecosystem, the industry as a whole, and it goes right through at the live uh, level to artists, managers, agents promoters, venues, and anybody else associated with that system. We're all very in interdependent. Mm -hmm. So we sort of see it like that, that it's not this is for the, the venues to pay or this is for the promoters to pay. It's an industry solution that we need to find. But in the end, you're sort of the cash cow. I mean, the, the, the analogy that, that strikes me as a member of this committee, it's a bit like the Premier League. You know, they are in the middle of a row with the rest of the football pyramid about how much of their golden goose can be shaken down to keep other clubs alive. Mm. It's, it feels to me like a very similar... You know, the analogy is quite strong. I think it might look like the cash cow, but with the range of venues we have, one or two might be, a lot are not, but, uh, in the NAA. Because if I say we've got 24 members in the NAA, how many can you think of that play regularly big arena tours? And you probably wouldn't come up with all that many that do that. And I think the analogy with the, with the football world is, is, is slightly different um, in that you know, my, my team is Chesterfield. We just got promoted to, from the National League. Um, but we didn't do that with funds from the Premiership. You know, the, the payments that come down from the Premiership by and large, will uh, go mostly to the championship clubs, which would be like us funding the academy circuit, yeah. you know, the 3,000 capacity venues. So it's slightly yeah. different. So, so I, I take it you're rejecting the idea of the levy. What would you do instead? Uh, we've, and this is a member's question for, for the NAA. So the favourite option uh, among the NAA members, um, apart from the, 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 the VAT cut that we've already talked about, is, is what we've become known as, as the Antishikari model, which we may talk about. The, 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 they, I mean, for, for those who don't know, they agreed to yes. take a cut of a, a pound per ticket. It was the same thing, wasn't it? And your organisation matched it. Well, at, at Wembley we did, yes. Yeah. And I felt it was, it was a gesture. You know, it's, it, we thought it was the right thing to do because it was the first time a band had come into Wembley with that, mindset of we're going to donate this money to the MVT. We're already, already sort of close to the MVT and we have an ongoing relationship and I wanted to say look, this is a gesture from our side. But as an ongoing for an artist or band to add, it doesn't have to be a pound but you know, whatever amount to a ticket price, <laughs> the important thing is that flows through and if it is a pound, it comes out the end of the pound as well so that it, yeah, managers, agents, promoters Nobody takes a cut on it. There isn't a cut on the booking fee if there's a percentage on that, and it comes out the way it went in. I assume touch. if you just have, as it were, a voluntary system, that yeah. wouldn't give stability, would it? Because you, you just wouldn't know from year to year what kind of income you're going to get. I think, I think I'm going to press John a little bit on that point. Artists are able to make a decision and everybody will flow behind them. However, we think it's much broader than that, and I think John's hinted at that. We think that everybody you're going to see today has a role to play in accepting that a one pound charge on a ticket is desirable, makes a sustainable system, can be invested wisely and support our grassroots. I think John's members almost have to not object to it as much as they have to campaign for it. I think we're gonna hear a lot that the artist, 
need to make this decision because we have the example of Enter Shikari. The reality is that in our industry, the artist is not always consulted on every levy. The reality is that, in fact, promoters and venues may frequently try and construct a model that is profitable around a tour in which the artist does not know about the transaction fee or the fulfilment fee or the restoration levy or the print or ticket at home charge. You know, we aren't constantly phoning up Chris Martin from Coldplay and saying, is it all right if we charge 12% booking fee rather than 10%? That's not really how our industry works. What we need is a, a consensus of consent. We need everybody that you're going to see today to say, yes, we're going to try and make this happen collectively, to collaboratively, and we will end up with a, a, a charge on every ticket. Irrespective of whether that's an industry-wide decision, if everybody who individually is here on behalf of their association says, actually my members are going to try and do that individually, when a promoter says to me they want to put a one-pound charge on, I'm going to say yes. If a promoter doesn't say that to me, I'm going to ask them whether they would like to. That kind of consensus is quite easy to build. Okay, as a final thought, John Collins, I'm conscious you've not yeah. contributed. Uh, thank you. Um, just very quickly, France, VAT on ticket is 5.5%. So even with a 3.5% levy, you'd still be you know, less than half the rate we're paying here. So I, we, it's not straightforward to just take examples from other territories. I think on the statutory levy, there's a, a concern as to how, who would set the rate, how would the money be distributed. You know, with, there are criticisms of the Arts Council, and you mentioned the, the grassroots scheme, and you know, overnight that was taken from being a grassroots music venue scheme to being a grassroots music scheme with no more money included in the fund. That, again, is that sort of instability that we do not want to have as an industry. So certainly there's been consensus around the live board that there is a way forward to develop uh, an industry-led solution which is based on that partnership approach that Mark talked about. One of the things I've learned in this sector having come into this role two years ago, is just the, the number of players that there are in making any decision or leading to the event <coughs> happening, you know, from the artist, the manager, the agent, the venue operator, the venue owner, the promoter, the ticketing agency. There are all of these different players that are, are within the process. We're fortunate that on the live board, we have all of those voices around the table and we think we can create... Um, a, a vehicle to receive funds and then also make sure those funds are spent by the experts in the right places that will have the most impact. I, I realise that I didn't actually answer your question. Yes, the French model works because no, no venues in France have closed. Right, OK. That's interesting. And, and to um, extend Damien's football analogy, um, in, a, in a word, because I'm trying to keep us to time... Uh, do you think we need a fan-led review of um, local music? I, I think fans and audiences' voices, especially from our local communities, are massively underrepresented, and I would strongly support a fan-led review. Um, John? Yes. We, would, we, would. we you know, People love live music. One gig every four minutes in 2022. In our own audience research, only 10% of people saying they don't think about going to live music. Fans are absolutely central to all of this. Playing to an empty room is not what an artist wants to do. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Judy. Thank you, Chair. I just... John Drury. <laughs> sounds awfully formal, this. I just want to go back to something you said, because I didn't quite understand what you meant. When you asked the question about £1, and you said it'll put 20%... <coughs> Oh, cost. Can you just explain that to me? I must yes, have missed it, what you meant. If it was the venue's pain, then the impact of that would be... For, for some venues, would be 20% of their profit for the year. It's oh, quite a significant yeah. amount. Right. Um, <coughs> and, and just, it didn't yeah, that's match what you said. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so given that there's been um, ad hoc contributions uh, from arenas to the grassroots, are there any current proper discussions going on about making this a long-term sector-wide commitment? Anyone? Shall I start on that one? Yeah, um, absolutely. So at the, the live board meeting um, in December and then again in February, we discussed this topic. And, and in between the meetings, we had a series of bilateral conversations to understand what would, what's the art of the possible here. And the consensus that came out of that was that 
you know, grassroots music venues are important. Grassroots music generally, broad, more broadly, is important. There are elements government could certainly do, as we've discussed. There is a role for industry to support and build on the sort of initiatives that John and Mark have talked about. John might expand on some of the other arena initiatives that, that are already in place. And that we want to create a live trust to be a charitable arm of our organisation, to be uh, a receiving house for those funds, to be a focal point for those industry efforts to raise funds, and then push that money back out to the experts who know where it needs to be spent and avoid duplication. And that would be things like the MVT Pipeline Fund, Music Managers Forum, Accelerator Programme, um, and the FAC's Step Up Programme, just to give three examples. You want to I think um, I think the will is there, <clears throat> and certainly from John's members, I, I will thank them for what they've already done. The scale of the problem is such that we do need something much more significant, and that requires everybody who is part of the live family to take action and to realise that they have a role to play in this. And I think, again, back to that um, consent form, uh, it can be led by artists. I'm fearful of making artists the linchpin around which these decisions are made. It so places them. Who in. would be the honest broker? Who would collect and distribute voluntary loving items? Uh, collect. I think John's live trust is a great idea for that because it gives everybody who's contributing a uh, a, 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 a stake in it and makes them feel that they're part of it uh, and gives them some control over what's coming in. I think in terms of distributing, we are a charity. We are already distributing quite significant funds to venues we wouldn't see that we need to be replicated by a live mm -hmm. trust or by anybody else. Um, there are, as John's mentioned, some existing <coughs> agencies that can do that. These are significant funds that could be raised by a £1 levy on arena and stadium tickets, and the reality is that that will be a, probably the most significant change made to our grassroots venues in the seven, seven decades they've been open. But what it will do is it will give us a sustainable ecosystem at that level that effectively then creates a sustainable ecosystem for everybody else. So I think it's great what's been done, but there is much, much more that must be done, frankly. John, do you want to comment on that? Uh, well, in terms of engagement with the MBT, I'm, I'm sort of quite pleased that we've gone as far as we have, but I accept that we, we all need to do more as an industry. And I think that's the key to it. Is, and I said ecosystem. We know that that's how we, how we work. And it's really important we all come together to, to find the right solution. So I say, for me, a pound on a ticket is not the way because that's, that's extra to the customer. But if we think we've got the wherewithal within the industry to find a way to make it work. So what happens when the, the really big artists come from a, to, on tour from abroad? Um, are they likely to pay a voluntary levy? Are they not likely to pay it? How, how will... <coughs> this is an interesting one, yeah. the, the balance between a mandatory levy and a voluntary levy. The reality is when British artists promoted by British promoters, managed by a British manager, represented by a British agent, go with a British production company to the Stade de France, they pay a levy to support French musicians. I can't think of anything much more absurd than that mm. if we cannot find a way that they're supporting British musicians when they're in Britain. Frankly, I'd quite like to see them support British musicians when they're in France, but if we can't do that, let's at least make sure that they are contributing. The whole thing is contributing back into our own ecosystem. But how, if it's a voluntary thing, will that happen? I, I think, again, that's up to the promoters, the arenas, the artists' representatives, the managers to collectively come together and find a way to explain that this is what they're going to do as a, as a general point of what they're doing. And I, I'm going to say openly, I don't really agree with John, and I don't, you won't mind me saying that. I think a pound on every ticket at arena and stadium level is incredibly easy to do. And we have done it multiple times for different reasons. And, and either everybody consented <coughs> to, to it in order to, to, to sustain the profitability or the sustainability of our arenas or the tour or the promoters. I see no reason at all why we can't do it for our ecosystem for grassroots music venues. I think it's incredibly easy to do. I'm not quite sure why it's taking us so long. Anybody else on any of that? I think there's a, there's a fundamental question here, which is, are we talking about industry practices that could be developed, advanced and, and rolled out in an organic way? Or are we, 
There is a concern that there's a legal question about whether competitive businesses could say, we are going to coordinate and put a one pound levy on a ticket. Now, so there is a, a competition aspect to that. And while competition law might not have been written to try and prevent you doing something good, it's still competition law and it could attract the attention of the Competition and Market Authority. So I think there's definitely a concern about how coordinated could we be in introducing this levy. But are we able to work together to advance all of the different mechanics and initiatives and promotion ideas that are already in place and roll out and make more popular and more populous those, those ideas? Yes, we absolutely can. And there's a willingness across live music to, to make that happen. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Yeah. Rupert. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Uh, my questions are mostly music venue trust ones for Mark, who's looking very dapper compared to his <laughs> jazz Sabbath days that we remember. <laughs> um, so first one, really, the three kind of initials that really stuck in our minds after the two roundtables we've had now were these words, that, these letters that strike fear into everyone's heart, P-R-S. Um, and I know there are a lot of gripes about the take that they, <coughs> the percentage they take. But your figures, your last report, says it's only 1.2% of average take, uh, turnover. That's 7,600. So why is it such an issue? I mean, a lot of these members are in the room. How come the mismatch between what they're saying and what you're saying? Um, the, well, the reality is that um, our members are, after 10 years of work with them, we, I think we now have a very good understanding of what PRS as work in our sector is trying to do, which is to protect the rights of songwriters. However, in our sector, a very large percentage, nobody really knows how much percentage, a very large percentage of the music performed is not represented by PRS. Our estimate is it's over 50% of the music performed isn't part of the catalogue of PRS. And so what my members feel is they feel, uh, bearing in mind what they're like, and you've met them, they're morally and ethically driven, they're passionate about the music they're doing, they do not like to see money being paid to an organisation that they know cannot be distributed to the songwriters who, who populate their venues because PRS do not represent those songwriters. And so they are concerned that whatever percentage it is of that £7,600 per average per venue... Let's say it was 50%. £3,800 of that, regardless of the fact it wouldn't affect their bottom line as much as you might think, they don't <coughs> think it's morally right for PRS to take that money and be unable to distribute it to the songwriters who performed in their venues. And they're very concerned, now they understand the system, what happens to that money? And one of my members has described that as a reverse Robin Hood. They come in and take 100% of the songwriter royalty on just about every show there is, and then they dis they're unable to distribute it. It ends up into what is colloquially known as the black box, and I'm not even sure what the correct name for it is. It's a fund that cannot be distributed, and three years later it is distributed on the basis of, as far as we understand, radio plays. What that means is that Taylor Swift or her representative, or whoever is the biggest earning PRS member, is receiving money from <coughs> grassroots songwriters that does not belong to them and adding it to an already wealthy pile. Understandably, my members find that frustrating. This is a slightly long answer, and my apologies. The second part they find frustrating is the level of admin. They, they have to try and prove who owns all these rights in a way that they simply don't have access to the information, are effectively acting as an information-gathering exercise on behalf of PRS for Music, and they don't think that's appropriate. How could we improve that? It sounded like it's very burdensome for them to keep records of every single song titled by original artists. Sometimes... It's promoters who do this, then they sort of shoot off, and it's impossible to get all this. How could we improve that and also improve the tariff rate? Because why aren't members having a say in this 1.2%? It, do, it doesn't seem That's, to add up between what we're It's 1.2% of the turnover yeah. of each venue. But, I, uh, but, but the actual, those artists who it concerns are not PRS artists of that high threshold so it just seems there's a lot of gripes how can we fix this and that actually anyone can answer that not just Mark. I'm going to be incredibly fair to, to PRS and say this is not planned it's not actually that they've said oh we need to go after grassroots music it is part of a general tariff and, and hopefully I think um, PRS when they speak to you later will be saying there is a review of um, tariff LP that's due to take place I understand next year 
What we would like to see is a tariff specific to the nature of the grassroots music venues, and that requires PRS to recognise there are now a huge number of songwriters out on our circuit who are not PRS members. They, they should also have their rights respected, and I think it's possible for PRS for Music to recognise that in this next review, to come to the table and say, actually, in this sector, a, a tariff GMV grassroots music venue is an appropriate next step forward so that we are collecting what we need on behalf of our members but money that really belongs in that sector remains there and benefits the whole ecosystem. Yeah, the two Johns, is it an issue at Wembley Arena? It, it, well, it's not, to be honest. I mean, I, I absolutely take Mark's point and I agree that that would be a good solution for the grassroots venues. Essentially, we, we collect the PRS and, and, pay, and pay it to them uh, that is just what happens. They're much happens. bigger artists. I think I lost yeah. sort of Arcade Fire at Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, so yes, that's, that's right. So that just comes off the top. The VAT comes off, the PRS comes off, and is paid. Yeah, we collect... The yeah, 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 completely. So it's sort of, it is a straightforward operation for us, but we get the headaches from, from Mark's side, absolutely. Um, just, just very briefly, there are opportunities to review how we work with PRS. As Mark says, there's one coming up, so... Let's take that opportunity. So, I mean, is there a compromise that also wouldn't hit um, songwriter remuneration? Because, again, there's going to be someone's nose out of joint, whatever you do. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, we have taken to describing uh, to our own members, uh, the music venues themselves, a songwriter royalty, which I think is a much more appropriate description in our, in our sector. It isn't just about PRS members. They are one of the most important collections agencies in the world. They do a fantastic job on behalf of artists at the larger level and at arena levels and on radio and TV broadcast. I represent some songwriters and I'm happy to say we are delighted with the way that PRS collects our royalties you know, at, at a more senior level. It is a very specific problem where we are seeing start-up artists who probably don't go any further in their careers. Let's say they raise £400 at the door. £16 of that is currently going into the PRS fund and it's not coming back out again to support that ecosystem. I believe that PRS can come up with something better than that and, and we want to fully support them to do that, but it does need something specific to this sector. OK, and if they're watching, I've got a songwriter in my constituency who's annoyed with them, but he writes jingles, so not quite the same thing. <laughs> anyway, I need to sort that out, but that's another thing for another day. Nice plug, Lupo. Well done. Thank, uh, Clive. Thanks, yeah. <coughs> uh, the... Um, the national planning policy framework was changed with uh, 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 agent for change, uh, um, and uh, you know it was designed to protect uh, pre-existing small, uh, grassroots venues. Uh, how has that changed the situation? I'll ask you, you first, and Mark, and then I'll come to John Collins. Um, yes, we, we work very closely with government and we campaigned for that over a number of years, the agent of change policy. We were pleased to see it put in the National Planning Policy Framework. There are a couple of problems remaining with it which government could address. One, it is not part of legislation and so therefore it is actually subject a little bit to how it's administered, how it's interpreted and you know, developers want to develop, which is, is good for building homes etc. But they do tend to try and challenge you know how much of it they have to do and the the other part of it is that we are still in a position unlike the theatres trust where we are constantly scanning and our members are scanning planning portals to alert them to when that framework should be being used and actually isn't being used we would like to see a statutory right of consultation being granted to our organization so that we can be like theatres trust whenever you're building near a music venue the application should be sent to us so that we can say okay, this is going to materially affect the, the venue, or it, or it isn't. You know, just not knowing is what slows down the planning process. We very frequently have to come in halfway through a planning process and say, wait a minute, you haven't actually identified that there's a music venue here. And actually, I'll be specific, in the case of Corsica Studios, the planning application had already been granted with a picture of Corsica Studios with Corsica Studios music venue written on it, but there was no reference to there being a music venue in the, in the planning application. But nobody had alerted anybody, and so therefore the planning process had, had continued. By the time we came in, it was too late to apply the agent of change principles. So I'd like to see it in legislation, although we recognise that's quite a major ask. 
but before that, a statutory right of consultation would really help. So, so just to be clear, on that example that you, you gave, that, that, that uh, agent of change didn't make any, any re- place any requirement on the planning authority to take any regard of the... Um, they they if, didn't overlook... They, they, it, it's voluntary whether they actually uh, apply it effectively. It, it's a guideline, it's a framework, rather than an actual statutory requirement, which is why that, that's complicated. But more importantly... Nobody actually recognised there was a music venue there, there during it. And we also have the recent case of Night and Day in Manchester, where the decision at the end of a long no- noise abatement notice effectively is that the Northern Quarter, one of the most well-known cultural districts in the, in the country, has been described by Jazz as a mixed-use area, effectively mm-hmm. placing 14 other music venues in Manchester at risk of a resident complaint. Now, if we think the agent of change framework is working... I'm not sure that the judge would have been able to say that. Mm. I think actually at that point, an agent of change framework would not be able to be overwritten by somebody saying, no, it's a mixed-use area, any, any music venue that's in that area needs to obey a noise abatement notice and needs to do whatever a resident wants to do. So in terms of, uh, of policy, you, you, you would say that uh, music venues should have a statutory right of consultation where a planning application could um, uh, impact on, on their operation. Yeah, 100%. And out, we run a thing called Emergency Response Service, which deals with these kind of things on behalf of venues. We are able to receive that. We've uh, written a number of times to government saying, actually, we had the statutory right consultation. I want to be clear, it would make the planning process easier rather than us playing catch up when we find out that a development is mm-hmm. going ahead. And John Collins, you, you need to add something? Um, just, just briefly. Manchester is not an isolated case. You know, we, we, we've seen it up and down the country where music music venues have rebranded neighbourhoods. Um, you can probably tell from my accent, I'm from Liverpool. The Baltic Triangle in Liverpool has been an area of mass development and lots of energy and great music venues in there. But then the residential developments follow and we've already now got venues that are under pressure in, in that part of Liverpool. So fundamentally agents of change we are welcome but it needs more teeth okay and and in terms of its impact on the 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 number of grassroots uh, venues i mean is there evidence that uh, the failure to apply uh, agent of change has led to the loss of venues yeah absolutely um very clear cases um really going back 15 years um, which was what led to a campaign for agent of change in the first place um, but very specifically, I would say, uh, let's do the numbers. Uh, last, in 2022, uh, around about 50% of our cases we were dealing with in the emergency response service were to do with planning or noise issues. Um, that has dropped, although it's now the same number of cases every year. It's just that the number of venues under financial threat has exploded more than, more than doubled. Uh, between 22 and 2023 and we're seeing the same pattern in 2024 over 50% of the cases we're now dealing with are financial troubles around about 20% are planning and development okay thank you thanks Clive back to Giles you know, just very quickly guys as we as I got you here because uh, 50 years ago I had a sticker on my guitar case which said keep music live we had the albums and people were buying albums and people like the Beatles went into just recorded music for a long period of time etc etc um, and um, just a, an, a, an opinion probably probably from you John um, where is the industry going um, strategically are we increasing live performances are they uh, uh, is the trajectory a positive one uh, I would say they're probably changing because the the ways of getting into the market have changed now and certainly the grassroots circuit is is a very important one but we see artists that play the arena for the first time that have become names on TikTok or YouTube right. and so that sort of streaming the digital way of accessing new artists and music is is absolutely real and it it is a surprise sometimes when we host an artist and we think they haven't played a show before and they're in an arena, yeah, you know, which is a surprise. Um, because it's really positive. Yeah, because I'm the same as you from you know, years ago. This is what we did. Yeah. But it has changed. But the, the, the old way, if you don't mind me saying it, uh, the old way is still there and very valid. Don't go to him and say that. That's <laughs> no, but it's all changed.
Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but it's a positive. Uh, I would say it's positive. Yeah. 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 Any other comments, guys? I, I'd say uh, that the number of TikTok breakthrough acts that are now going back to the grassroots in order to build an audience mm-hmm. and in order to build their skills is a remarkable turnaround in the last two or three years. Mm-hmm. We are overrun with people who've had a hit on TikTok desperately now trying to build the grassroots audience that gives them a sustainable career. It's a big thing in our sector for people to now be going out on tour, having jumped forward and then realised, wait a minute, I don't have the deep connection with my fans that I get from being in a room with 250 other people. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you. Positive note. Thank you. Thank you, Giles. Well, that concludes this panel. Thank you all so much for coming and uh, giving evidence to us all today. You're free. I can now (laughs) invite our second panel to join us, please. It's I've been told it will go up because a lot of people need to have been there at half past. Thank you very much, uh, our second panel, for joining us. We're joined by Stuart Galbraith, who is the Vice Chair of the Concert Promoters Association and CEO of Kilimanjaro Live, by Gavin Larkins, who is the Director of Commercial Development and Sales at PRS for Music, and by Anna Molson, who is the Co-Chair of the Associated in- of Independent Promoters. Thank you so much, uh, all of you, for joining us today. I want to really kick off by just getting a view from all of you about how the loss of grassroots music venues has impacted your own uh, members, your own organisations in terms of of work, in terms of revenues, in terms of the risk of taking on uh, shows and, and, and so on. Anna, can I start with you? Could you repeat the start of the question? It was how the closures of venues sort of yeah, how it's us. impacted your organisations, your members, in t- you know, in, in in every sense, really. I think recent closures, like um, well, the venue is going to close shortly in December. Club uh, Twenty Eight in Hitching. Uh, a couple of our members who regularly promote there won't be able to provide the vital kind of grassroots support for artists in the community. Um, I believe the last night that will be open is December 2024 and I think it's potentially quite sort of isolated in that area in the sense that it's one of the main kind of areas that people can go and experience live music. Um, I think the sort of case of Bath Moles is that they were in-house hirers and some of our members are in-house hirers uh, in the sense that they're in-house programmers, um, curators of music Um, and again you know it's just the impact on that ability to sort of come together and highlight music in, in live in the industry and, and keep it rolling. But, you know, over lockdown, obviously we couldn't do our jobs and that was very tragic and that gave us the idea, you know, and the understanding of how important a venue is and a platform. You know, streaming was very difficult to make money out of um, and, you know, the venue is, is the heartbeat and that's where we kind of belong as promoters. And the same question to you, Stuart. How is the, um, the you know, we're hearing that grassroots music venues are closing at the rate of about two a week. What impact is that having on you, your organisation, your members, uh, and the sort of revenues that are coming forward? Um, well, I'll, I'll speak first of all on, on behalf of Kilimanjaro Group, um, and, and I think the closure of grassroots venues has has several impacts on us. First of all, it's more difficult for us to break new artists because there are less venues that we can go out and play. Uh, secondly, uh, with the escalating costs of those venues, it's more difficult to actually make those shows viable. Uh, and indeed, if they're not viable, they can't take place. And thirdly, uh, it restricts the, the talent stream for us in a way, of, in, in the form of personnel rather than agent, uh, rather than artists. Because most of the, if you look at our membership across the CPA, most of the 60 members either have principals or major promoters that started off as promoters in grassroots music venues. I certainly was one of those. I was a social tech at Leeds University. Uh, our two main directors both started as local venue promoters. And so if there are no local venues, then there won't be the development of those local venue promoters. Do you have any impact on PRS? Um, I think I'd, well, I'd echo um, 
quite a lot of what Stuart said. So I think the, the general reflection today is that the live music industry is an ecosystem. Um, nothing happens in isolation. So even songwriters who want to um, develop their craft and cut their teeth, many um, create jingles, um, many compose for TV, but actually a vast, um, a significant number of PRS's members also perform live or have their works performed live by other people. Mm. Um, and not having those venues means that there's, there's nowhere to play, essentially, um, but also there's not a circuit to play around either. I think Mark referenced the Oasis um, concert that he, he put on 30 years ago. That was part of a significant tour of the UK. Mm. Um, that tour would be quite hard to replicate today, essentially, because there aren't the venues there, which means that you're relying on a high, hyper-local availability of talent which before a circuit would um, afford. I think the other point for, for PRS is we're, we're collecting the, the um, songwriter royalties for them. So essentially it's their earnings um, that are impacted more so than PRS as the organisation. It's a songwriter that, that loses out um, from not having the ability to earn, essentially. Thank you. Um, Anna, can I just quickly uh, touch upon what other pressures there are on your members outside of the loss of grassroots music venues and the current economic climate? Is there anything else that's impacting uh, their ability to support the live music uh, ecosystem? I think one thing, just following on from what we were talking about, the actual threat of closure of venues, um, it, it has you know, a huge impact on promoters and artists and the venue owners themselves and the staff who work there, their, their sort of mental health really. And um, we don't really, you know, it's been quite uncertain in Brighton where I regularly promote with a number of grassroots venues due to um, potential developments nearby, um, you know, whether our gigs can happen. You know, we kind of work quite far ahead. We work six months to a year ahead, um, you know, and it's difficult for us although we are quite agile and used to change and quite dynamic as, as, as a, a kind of a job, um, you know, the people who are promoters are quite agile. You know, it's difficult for us to just totally change, you know, what we do really. Um, but there are a number of, of things that are affecting us. You know, we are realising at AIP there's less younger promoters come through. You know, when we started, the people in their sort of 30s plus, you could, especially in a city like Brighton, you could afford to work part time and still develop your business. Um, you know, there's also a lot of goodwill within our um, industry that's potentially, you know, wearing out because 50% of the shows that we put on, we fund or we lose money on. Um, so we do a vital job in terms of, you know, supporting artists and the whole sort of infrastructure. Um, that is a real problem. Um, also, PRS feels like a tax, but I'm sure we'll come on to that. Um, you know, 20% taken out of a grassroots show. Say, you know, the ticket price as a show that I've got on tonight in Brighton is £10. Um, you take the VAT out, and the possibility of earning money is, you know, 10 times 100. That's you know 200 out of that. The cost nearly 800. There's nothing left for the promoter, mm. so it's not uh, sustainable. Our industry um, going forward, we do worry for our future really. Mm. Um, and there's you know there's the threat. I mean I could go on. I hope you don't mind. Uh, <laughs> there is the threat of you know uh, there's you know a way of categorising cities in the UK. Agents tend to use it of the A-list towns. You know so the Glasgow's the um, Manchester's, the Birmingham's, the London's of you know potentially uh, artists just playing those cities whereas previously they would go to the B-list towns such as Leeds and, and uh, Brighton where I'm from uh, you know so it does cut, cut down on, on our margins really. Yeah. So did you have anything to add to um, Anna's points on the other sort of impacts on your sector from the kind of wider sort of economic challenges and the uh, um, wider pressures? I, I think I'd, I would support Anna, Anna's views that, that if a show is not financially viable, I think it's important to understand the relationship of the venue owner to the rest of the ecosystem that works at that level. And so uh, effectively the independent promoter, or in our case uh, a national promoter that's, that's working at a grassroots level, we're the, we're the risk takers, we're, the, we're the, the bankers for the process, so we rent the venue, we pay the bands. If that model doesn't stack up, then the show doesn't happen. And if the show doesn't happen, then nobody makes money, or, or indeed nobody has employment 
Uh, and I think it's important to understand that it, this isn't a crisis that just sits in at the venues. It's actually the entire uh, grassroots ecosystem. And that's the artists, it's the independent promoters, it's the national promoters that work at that level, it's the venue operators, it's the freelancers that work independently uh, outside of companies, it's PA companies, it's trucking companies, etc. So the, the issue is not just with the venue, it's the whole, the whole process mm -hmm. at that level is, is, now not bro is now not functioning. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Um, very briefly, Anna, um, you were just talking about a gig you've got tonight, which I'm promoting right now. Um, <laughs> but uh, for a, my job. a ten or a ticket, <laughs> fantastic. Um, we all know of venues, uh, for instance, in, in pubs in London, in Soho, wherever, where there is no, no ticket charge. You go in, there's a live band playing, but they make their money on the drink and, and the other peripherals. D do you have that? that extra income coming in over and above the £10 ticket? And if so, what sort of percentage does it make up? No, our main income is the ticket. The ticket? Yeah, our main income is the ticket. Um, and so we, you know, shoulder the financial burden, you know, at the end of the night, if you haven't made the money, you look around the room and I'm not, I'm not decrying other people are getting paid, but I'm just saying from our point of view that the sound engineer gets paid, the people behind the bar get paid. The artists get paid, and you know we, you know, walk away without money, money to sustain our, our business. Really, yeah. It's incredible value, but anyway, mm. that's, that's not what I, what I want to know, uh, Stuart. Um, do you, in principle, support a scheme that uh, that uh, would see money go from arenas down to the grassroots? Uh, no, I don't, because I don't think it was the, is the most efficient solution. Um, I think uh, that. There are other ways that the grassroots uh, uh, sector can be supported. Uh, and I'm, I'm, in terms of sitting here in front of you today, I'm, I'm somewhat unique in so much that I work at grassroots ve levels, uh, but we also work in arenas and stadium levels. We also work outside of music and work in theatre as well. Um, and there are solutions in theatre that don't, uh, I believe, would be applicable to, to music. Uh, but I think my, my main principal objection to any sort of statutory levy is that if you look at the track record of government in terms of being able to fund money into an industry, and we'll take music as a particular example, uh, during the pandemic, uh, the money that the Arts Council granted under CRF, under Co Co Corona Relief Fund, really didn't get to the right places. Uh, and it would worry me terribly uh, if any sort of levy was being administered by a government department because they do not understand our industry. They don't understand the ecosystem at that, that grassroots level. Uh, and as Mark said earlier on, I think even the French model uh, is fraught with, with, it, with issues in so much that that money doesn't get through to where it needs to be. That 3%? Yeah, yes. Um, so it's, it's not a matter of the principle of the money being uh, charged at arenas and going to grassroots. It's a matter of administration and how it's managed then. Yes, and, and I, I think since, uh, and as, as John from Live was saying earlier on, I do think that there, there is an optimum solution, and that is, is a solution that is put in place within the, within the industry. Uh, I do think that we know our industry best. Uh, the, the prospect of a charitable trust that is then has representatives, representatives upon it that knows the industry inside out and knows how to get that money to the, the freelancers who during COVID got absolutely nothing from the Arts Council, uh, to the small promoters, to the bands, as well as the venue operators. I think that is the way forward. That's the way forward. Yes. Uh, on the board of that theatrical tr uh, sorry, uh, trust, you would, you would um, have people like yourself and people like Anna and people who really understand, and, and indeed musicians. Yes, I, I think, I think the, the discussions that, that have been had at live would actually put key member, would put key trustees on that uh, board who know the industry and actually and indeed represent the industry. Uh, they represent the freelancers, they represent the artists, they represent the production companies, they represent the small independent promoters and the small independent festivals. And they will know, based upon the merits of an application, where the money needs to go, rather than 
the money going to people who are best at filling in a government form or indeed have employed a company who are expert at filling in the forms, uh, which is exactly what happened during COVID. Absolutely. Well, I hope people are listening. I mean, it, we, we know that uh, the artists themselves are are keen on seeing money go to the grassroots in this way. Was it Enter Shikari uh, did that uh, one pound uh, mm -hmm. from their gig and then they, it was followed up by ASM Go Global who match funded mm -hmm. them. It, it, it's, it's a bit patchwork and a bit piecemeal. It just needs a bit more organisation through some central fund, would you say? That's it. I, I, I certainly believe so. And I, I do think the Enter Shikari model um, uh, was, was admirable. Uh, we have discussed it, we've discussed it with Mark, and Mark was the architect of that, and, and that, that model can actually be made a lot more efficient, uh, and you can ensure that 100% of those donations would reach the trust for distribution. Uh, the way that Enter Shikari did it was inside the ticket price. It effectively pushed the ticket price up by a pound, yeah. uh, and I think it's, it's realistic to, to expect that uh, within within the, the larger music industry, any sort of charge that's going to be made is not going to be absorbed by the industry. It will get passed on to the customer. Uh, but, but in the case of Enter Shikari, because it was inside the ticket, 20% uh, of it went on VAT, 4.2% of it went on, v on uh, PRS, uh, an element of it went on building rental, and an element went of it on insurance. And if you add that up, 47% of that money did not reach its destination because of those, those effective shares. If you place it outside the ticket, and if the charitable trust had charitable status, there would be no VAT deduction, there would be no PRS deduction, there would be no venue share, and 100% of that money would reach, would reach the actual uh, target. Amazing. Thank you. If, if it weren't man mandatory, but was a voluntary levy, uh, would there be a uh, danger of, um, how can I put it, bad actors undercutting, do you think? Undercutting, if there's a voluntary le levy, then some people don't pay it and they undercut the ticket prices and, and the, the business becomes unstable. I think we work, the, the industry is extremely competitive um, at, at all levels. Um, but it equally, uh, I do think, as, as Mark uh, alluded to earlier on, uh, that there is a responsibility now within the sector to protect and support the grassroots ecosystem, um, particularly uh, with British artists. I'm a British promoter. 90% of my business works in Britain. 90% of it is British talent. Uh, and I do think that now is the time that the industry, through live uh, and in conjunction with, with Mark and the efforts that he's made, is the time for us to now step up and actually support an initiative like this. And I think we've covered it. Thank you, Chair. Thank, Thank you, you. Jazz. Thank you. Uh, Rupert. Yeah, back to PRS questions. Um, what proportion <coughs> of songwriter revenues are from live music? Right, so we distributed somewhere around 50, 60 million pounds last year for live music. Um, and that's of a total of about 900 million. That's from 2022. We haven't published our 2023 figures yet. In the grassroots uh, music venues we spoke to did feel that fees are too high, margins are tight nowadays. A lot, it was heartbreaking to hear how people have closed their kitchens, they don't do food anymore, lots of sacrifices they're having to make, and there's this perception that PRS <coughs> is creaming off an unnecessary percentage that's not even going to the musicians who play in their venues. Um, so what quality assurance do you have that grassroots music venues are paying the right amount? Yeah. No, no, thank you for the question. I think I appreciate you framing it as a perception as well because I think that the evidence that, that we see, um, we certainly don't um, recognise the number that was quoted earlier in terms of the number of works performed that weren't in our, in our membership. So in 2022, so when that 50 or so million was distributed, that was over 128,000 events. So that was set list, you, you need a set list to be able to distribute. So that's 128,000 events that had a set list that was either submitted by the venue themselves, or it was submitted by the member themselves, or it was found by um, someone at PRS through their own research. So we've set up a couple of things for members to do that. Um, we have what's called a set list hub where members can essentially register their set list and say all the venues they played in with that set list and then we're able to match and distribute it for them. We run a, something called a gigs and clubs scheme so if a member um, plays or has their works played um, at that venue they can claim from the gigs and clubs scheme as well. 
Um, and I think the other point to note is also that the performer is not always the songwriter. So I think we, we frequently hear, well, the artist isn't a PRS member, and we endorse that. There are many artists who perform that don't write their own music. Um, likewise, there are people that um, write specifically um, as part of a co-writing team. So one writer may not be, one may be. Also in the grassroots sector, um, there's a lot of cover bands as well, a lot of tribute acts. So actually, the amount of PRS repertoire that is being performed will likely be different to the number of performers that are PRS members. I mean, one venue we spoke to said their fees have doubled. So again, these numbers that were given in the um, MVT report and stuff, don't, uh, GMV yeah, report, don't seem to add up with what we're hearing. Um, they said their fees have gone up from two thousand to four grand a year, and ninety-five percent of the artists who play there are not PRS registered. So they're effectively subsidising. Um, the big boys, you know, established artists. That's not fair, is it? So, so likewise, I think yeah, so they, those performers may not be PRS members, but those performers may be performing PRS member works. Um, in terms of the fee doubling, our tariff has been the same for six years now. So the tariff can vary in terms of the bill you pay will vary toward the proportion of tickets sold, um, the price of the tickets and how much revenue was made from that concert. Um, I think it's also fair to say that the 4% charge that PRS takes is 4% of the ticket. So similar to the point that Anna made, um, the 4% comes off of the ticket, um, but 96% doesn't. Um, the money from the bar, the cloakroom, um, any food and drink that's provided elsewhere, that, that's all revenue that's not part of the songwriter's income. But 4% of the ticket price is for the songwriter's income. And I think I would also sort of, sort of challenge the terminology of, sort of people referring to it as a tax, because it's not. It, PRS are the, are the conduit between their works being performed and the songwriter being paid, and it's how songwriters earn their living. As I said, by the way, I've got a constituency issue. And I, and I would have, I, I, I it's a direct one. Know what it is. It's been going on for years and years, and you, you're not budging. Well, I, I, anyway, I can't comment on a specific case, but actually happy to correspond with you okay. um, separately outside on that. I mean, um, again, what do you think of the suggestions in the last selection to have a grassroots tariff that's less um, penalising? Well, obviously, we wouldn't see any tariff as penalising. It's essentially the fair value of the use of that music um, for the songwriters um, that wrote it. Um, the tariff review that, that was referenced by the guys earlier um, sort of will kick off soon and we'd be open to proposals. I think it's worth remembering that the tariff that is being discussed here in, in the meeting today um, was set in collaboration and consultation with many of the parties you're hearing from on this panel, including Mark. Um, the tariff was then subsequently endorsed by the Copyright Tribunal, which is completely independent of all of us parties who negotiated it. So the, the tariff isn't set in a vacuum. The tariff is set in consultation and collaboration with the industry um, on behalf of the songwriters in PRS's case. Um, but if any of those parties um, came to the next review with proposals everything would be considered and we'd be open-minded in the approach to the review, as I'm sure they would be for the concerns that we may raise from songwriters as well. Why do Brits and mortar venues, with all their associated costs, as we know energy prices have gone through the roof, staffing, all that stuff, business rates we've talked about, why do they pay a higher rate than music festivals? That was negotiated as part of the previous um, tariff negotiation, essentially, and it was reflective of the, I guess, how broad the bills were, the bills as in the, um, the acts that were playing. Um, and essentially the previous rate in the tariff was a 3% for everybody. Um, and then in the new tariff, and I, I say this as I wasn't part of the negotiations, but the negotiations, as I understand it, were that the average festival would have other acts like comedy, spoken word and, and other things going on as part of their bill and their music use so less of a portion of the ticket went to them whereas the concerts that the 4% rate attracted when that went up was essentially all music so it was to do with the blend of the bills on the festivals Is this going to be looked at in the review because not every festival has got comedy? Well the tariff 
the tariff review essentially will be a comprehensive review. So essentially anything that's brought to the table will be reviewed um, and then obviously the outcome will be as per the discussions that we have in consultation and then if any changes to the tariff are um, suggested then the Copyright Tribunal will be asked to review and endorse those changes because it's a tribunal endorsing all the tariff already. Okay, and lastly, our screening inquiry recommended that DCMS work with collecting societies to find alternatives to distributing black boxes pro rata. Is it time to look again at how this is <coughs> spent? Um, I mean, I think we regard that as a sort of spurious term that's not used at, at PRS. Um, in terms of live royalties, I think it's been referenced before, there are unmatched royalties at any one time sitting in the pot. And it's that part that when, when a member submits that set list through the set list hub or um, their gigs and clubs scheme, they're claiming from that pot. If a writer hasn't updated their payment details recently and we owe them money, it's sitting in that pot. Um, if we're waiting for works to be registered properly, it's in that pot. So I think it's fair to say that that general pot of funds to be distributed is a number of different reasons. I think with live, um, it is a bit different to streaming um, in the fact that we have set lists from members who are writing those songs or they're aware that someone else is performing the songs they've written. And it's those set lists that, either from the venue or the member, that is critical to that distribution. Thanks. Thanks, Rupert. Um, Gavin, what are the timescales on the tariff review? So the tariff review, um, we set a date of by the end of Q2 25 for the review to be complete. So we'll start discussions with, well, we have informal discussions all the time with the trade bodies. We'll probably formally start um, discussions after the summer. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, continuing on the PRS uh, um, uh, licensing. Can we, when we had our round table with uh, grassroots um, uh, venues, one of the strongest reactions we got was uh, to PRS. Now, you, you've made it sound very reasonable, and uh, but but they were, were describing uh, a situation where it's anything but reasonable. Um, so so when they're so looking at the reporting requirements, um, so um, they are required to provide you with information that they may not have, which is such as uh, you know song titles um, uh, and uh, set lists and things like that. Um, so, just take us through how would PRS deal with a, 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 a small grassroots venue um, with limited sort of resources to be able to sort of carry out that sort of administration? How would PRS approach someone who is struggling to provide you with the information that uh, you require? Um, I think in, briefly, collaboratively, essentially. So, our tariff terms are essentially a set of rules. The rules are how to charge, um, so how much money in royalty terms you'll pay, um, and also the information that is required to be provided alongside those payments. So grassroots visit menus, in the same way that, that Wembley and others would do, is under the terms of tariff would need to provide the requisite information for us to determine the correct royalty. So in the first instance, the venue would need to provide the information so we could work out exactly how much to charge them. So we wouldn't want to overcharge. Um, we're looking just to charge the exact amount that is <coughs> set out in the tariff. Um, and then accompanying that is the essentially the set list. And PRS has um, immeasurable flexibility in how those set lists are received. Many set lists we have on file because um, the member has uploaded them or, or made a submission to us. But also we receive them to take the photo of the set list on the front of the stage and, and send it in. It doesn't have to necessarily be typed out in a, in a formal Excel document with all the writers noted. I think even the, the tariff sort of says where possible or where practical to provide that information. So I think we would work collaboratively with the venue and essentially ask well, what can they provide? What systems can we help you put in place to um, to capture that information in a sort of lighter touch way than, than it may be and maybe even sharing best practice with our other venues do it um, and other venues do comply because the vast majority, I'll say of 128,000 events to be distributed on, we would have had to have received a, a significant amount of cue sheets. At, uh, so how much of what you do though is based on assumptions about what's, uh, what should be charged? Because we've heard... Uh, <coughs> Uh, from from uh, you know managers of grassroots venues that um, um, you know they face litigation from you um, for 
but for charges against things that, that you know that, that don't happen, such as you know the size of the venue being greater than uh, in, in your in your eyes greater than than it actually is, or for um, events that, that you know in one case for an, a number of events that, that that just can't possibly take place because they're not licensed for that number of events in a year, and yet you are saying that that you know that they they did have more. Uh, events than they could possibly put on. So how reasonable are you when, when people put that case to you? Because we, we are hearing that people are facing litigation. Yes, well I think if, um, take, take the sort of second point on litigation, um, there are two types of litigation that, um, that PRS undertakes through its, um, through its agent, um, PPL PRS. Um, one is copyright infringement, so that is where a, a venue or business uses music without a licence. Um, and the other type is when um, a sort of breach of contract terms, essentially, so where payments haven't been made. Um, we'd only take that litigation or threat of litigation in the last resort, when we've exhausted all possible options to collaborate and to work with them through the relationship. And the points that you raised around estimating what the <coughs> bill should be, essentially, when in my previous answer talking about how we determine the royalty, we do require a certain amount of information from the customer to work out what the royalty for the songwriter should be. If that information isn't provided, we will need to make an estimate of what that royalty should be. If the venue or business then has the actual numbers, we would correct that invoice to make it actual and, and correct, um, and it would be that that we would um, seek payment on. So on the litigation front, if we were threatening litigation because they were... Um, not licensed and not willing to take out a license um, that would be different to if they were um, licensed but, but not paying under a correct invoice once it's completely correct and after they collaborated to the extreme point and not got to that last resort point. Yes but we're not talking about, I, I, my question is not, not about people who are not licensed, this is about encouraging payment where fees are wrongly applied. So this is essentially this is the estimate. So if they have, if the venue hasn't provided the correct information for us to correctly levy the right charge under the tariff, the est an estimate will be drawn up, and the estimate will be the invoice that's sent. And the litigation that you're referring to would be litigation un as a debt action, essentially as a claiming the debt back. However, if that venue was in touch with us and provided the correct information, we would cancel that estimated invoice, raise a actual invoice that is correct, work out payment plans and have various conversations around how best to make the payment. I mean, this, I mean it, it does sound very, very heavy-handed for what is a very, very small business in, in many instances. I mean, we're also told that you, you require um, the information to be uh, provided in, in paper form, not in digital form. Uh, are PRS trying to uh, you know, move into um, the, the, the digital format so that, um, you know, that some of the um, pressures on, on, on administration can be reduced? I, I don't recognise um, that request, actually. So PRS is a... Um, has got a significant number of initiatives, um, both publicly and within the business, um, to digitise its business. We moved a lot of our work to the cloud, so we're able to do far more efficiently and process far more data than we ever had before. <laughs> so, um, I mean, if it's a specific case, I'm, I'm happy to well, sort of you directly. Uh, but we're, we're to talk about Music Venue Trust, that, that uh, info is information is provided in a manual rather than digital format. Is that You're saying that's not correct? It's certainly not a request that, that I've heard made, but I can I'm, I can happy to write to you afterwards. It's not something I recognise, so um, it's yeah. okay. Okay, well, well, just, just can I just open it up to, 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 to Anna and Stuart and just to, to say <coughs> what what can um, PRS do to improve, improve the situation? The the, the uh, information that, um, that, that that PRS requires, you know, in some instances, would, would be held by promoters. Um, so is there, is there um, more that PRS can do to uh, alleviate the, the burdens on, on, on small venue um, owners? I'll come to you, Stuart. Um, uh, as, as Gavin alludes to, I, I believe there is a tariff LP review that is, is literally just starting. Um, I'm pleased to hear of the timeline for uh, summer 2025. Uh, I think, again, in other territories, to look at models outside of the UK, 
Uh, if you look at Ireland, for instance, PRS is levied at certain levels and it increases as the gross on a particular show gets higher. So certainly a lower uh, PRS levy uh, at the, uh, the grassroots level would be certainly welcome to promoters such as myself or, or Anna. Um, but uh, I, d I do think it's also important, though, to, to, to consider the scale of the impact of what you're discussing at PRS, be because I think the, the single biggest change that you could make and, and the committee could recommend to uh, make grassroots venues and the ecosystem viable would be that of VAT. Um, and the VAT uh, cut during the <coughs> pandemic literally made the difference between us being able to promote shows or not promote shows. Uh, the, the, the 20 percent tax burden versus five percent literally meant that we could do a hundred more shows that that year as we came out of pandemic and we now look at those shows uh, and they are just not viable and so those shows never get off never get off the uh, starting blocks they never reach past the spreadsheet and the offer for the artist never gets made um, so I, I think the taxation burden is at 20 percent is significantly a bigger issue to consider than a, a levy of 4.2% uh, on PRS. I agree with Stuart just on that uh, point, and then I'll move on to PRS. I mean, at 5% over lockdown, that was so welcome with our members because it meant that we could break even, which meant we could cover costs and actually make money, which is very surprising on the grassroots level. Um, some of our members are now turning down grassroots shows in order that they can be, be uh, below the threshold of having to be VAT registered. So that means less artists able to be you know, taken on by promoters and developed by them. In terms of PRS, you know, our members welcome the fact that when an artist is not present in a room and their music is being played, they should definitely have um, compensation for that and, and the royalty um, that that brings through PRS but when you have a situation where we are very close to um, you know having real lack of funds as promoters you're looking at everything and PRS just feel like a tax to us and it feels like a tax because it's not kind of true to its original um, intention which was you know it was sheet music that composers and artists uh, created and they weren't either present there or able to make money from it which is totally valid but when you're already paying an artist to perform their original music and then having to pay PRS on top of that it just feels like an extra tax and if PRS didn't exist in that scenario um, I would feel that um, the artist would, would make on a successful show without a fixed fee um, you know, more money because PRS have a lot of admin charges as are well. Are you referring to artists that are not on the PRS catalogue? Or or, or? Well, that's also an issue, but I'm referring to artists on the PRS catalogue. But we also, you know, question this non-distributable fund that's collected. I mean, you know, any other business would be um, questioned about that, and I suppose that's what we're doing here now. But, um, you know, a lot of the artists we put on on a grassroots level are not PRS registered. They're, you know, they're working out whether they want to go forward with their career. They're working out whether they want to um, become professional um, and, you know, have that kind of income and, and all that kind of um, bureaucracy that they have to sort of um, have on top of running running their bands. So quite a lot of them aren't. And then, you know, you feel as a promoter and a venue owner who also promotes, because we promote about sort of 50% of the events that happen in grassroots venues as freelance or in-house um, uh, you know as an extra an extra charge in these quite austere times Thank you, Thank you Clive can I um, Stuart can I just quickly take you back to a, an answer you gave us a, a minute ago and just invite you to clarify because um, you said that um, on the um, enter shikari gig uh, where they made a charitable donation to the um, music venue trust, that um, that there was that there was VAT and PRS fees deducted from that. But um, the information we have from the MVT is that actually there was no VAT or PRS fees involved in that particular case. Um, so on that basis, the whole pound went straight from the the gig to the MVT. Under a scenario like that, surely you would endorse. Uh, a similar kind of levy 
And I'd endorse anything that would get the maximum amount of, of income to the grassroots uh, level. Uh, I haven't discussed with Mark in detail. Uh, I wasn't the commercial promoter for uh, the Enter Shikari show. But as a principle, if something is inside of the ticket price, excise will want 20% of that, that figure. PRS will also want, by definition of the LP tariff, 4.2% of that. It will need to be insured, which adds another 4% to it, and a venue will take a percentage as a rental. So whether there was a, a, a separate arrangement on Shikari, I don't know. Uh, but the print, the, what I'm advocating is that any charge, if it's carefully accounted for, can 100% of it can arrive at the grassroots level. So if it could be labelled as a charitable donation and therefore exempt from the uh, the various extra deductions that you've mentioned, then that would be a different kettle of fish. Yes, correct. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Giles. Oh no, not done, Giles. Damien. Let's try <laughs> Thank Damien. you. Um, <laughs> Picking up on, on the, the, the VAT point yeah, you, you just made, um, and just entering a, a degree of cynicism, that uh, if in, as it were, non-lockdown times, uh, you had a, a special VAT rate, wouldn't that just quietly drift out into higher profit margins for the many other people involved in the chain? Uh, no, I don't believe that it would, uh, be because... Uh, at this point in time, uh, promoters like Anna or ourselves are not doing shows because the, the economics don't work. Um, if uh, there's a 20% uh, additional income or an ad increase of income, then it enables that show to then get confirmed. It then delivers a rental to the venue. It delivers a fee to the band. It delivers wages to the, the crew that are working. Uh, and it ultimately drives footfall through those venues, which is what we're seeing is not happening at the moment. And as I said, our volume of shows at the lower level, sub 1,000, sub 400 capacity, is significantly lower now than it was in 2022 as we came out of pandemic because a large proportion of those shows just are not getting confirmed. I mean, it, it seems to me, I mean, one of the, 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 the witch report, um, obviously into, into bigger shows, um, showed that for a £45 ticket, one of, one of the ticketing companies managed separately to add on a service charge, a facility charge, and an order processing fee, all of which sounds like verbiage to me, um, which, which added £10.60 to yes. the top of a £45 ticket. So in those circumstances, you can understand the cynicism of, OK, fine, you can pay less VAT, mm -hmm. but at that level, you're going to end up with, with somebody else pocketing the money. No, I, I think the solution is, is not to look at a VAT reduction across the industry as a whole. I think what I would advocate is that it should be under a certain level, so under a thousand capacity f as an argument, as an argument uh, that everything under that capacity has a, a, a beneficial VAT rate. That way you will stimulate live shows at that level. You will see more shows play those venues. You will see those venues become less loss-making and you will see less close. Okay. I assume you agree with that, Anna? Yes, I, I definitely do. I mean, how to be a promoter on the continent. You know, <laughs> Belgium, 6%. France, 45 Italy, 10%. Germany, 7 I must say that that's really focused on tickets. Um, you know, they... Um, you know, that's levied on, on the sort of tickets. But as I said before, you know, our members are turning down shows because they want to be below the threshold. Um, you know, we can't break even. The, the economy, economics of it all doesn't add up on a grassroots level if you're trying to earn a living from it. Um, you know, that, that does sort of feel like a real burden. And one of the main issues that our uh, 150 nearly members across the UK fed back in a survey was PRS and VAT, you know, the sort of like responsibility, the sort of financial burden that we take as mainly the freelancers, um, you know, when everyone else in the room potentially gets gets paid. But, you know, that's not decrying the fact that the venue might be down on bar sales as well because they, you know, with respect to venues. Okay. It, it could well be that the VAT on alcohol sales and ancillary incomes is also potentially reduced at that level. And again, that would make a very profound effect to, to the venue operator. But, but I do think, I mentioned earlier that I work in theatre. Uh, in theatre, there's a theatre tax relief scheme, uh, which is absolutely invaluable. Um, and, and indeed, yesterday, I confirmed six shows based on the fact that we were very certain that we were going to get theatre tax relief. 
without that tax relief, those shows would not have taken place. Now, in the case of music, though, you can't apply a tax relief scheme because the financial structure of our sector is not similar to theatre or film or orchestras, where you don't have a producer principle and there is no one entity that can apply for a tax relief scheme uh, because you have the promoter, you have the band, you have the venue, we're all separate VAT entities uh, or tax entities. So, uh, and we've researched, we've researched whether it made sense to apply to Treasury for a tax relief scheme for music, and I'm afraid our model just doesn't work, which is why I think a VAT reduction is a sensible option. For small venues. For small venues, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, finally, Julie. Thank you, Chair. Um, Anna, Arts Council England recently opened up its support and grassroots music fund to indie promoters. Um, what will this funding help support? Well, I mean, it's, we've definitely welcomed the fact that it's um, been open and, um, you know, that sole traders can also apply, which pre-pandemic, a few years before, we weren't able to, you had to be limited or CIC registered. Um, the only problem we have is that we're time poor, our work's really seasonal. Mm. Uh, the application, although it has become easier, still has a way to go in terms of us being able to access it because it's 50 odd pages long um, you have to use a certain kind of language so you have to be informed and experienced to fill it out um, and there's a lot of reporting though you know we do welcome the fact that we've been uh, recognized as as a sort of to be able to access the funds and if we can access the funds uh, then you know it will help us develop our trade which most of our members don't access mm. um, you, you know. said you preempted my follow up about mm. uh, expertise and time to administer mm. the funding what, is there anything that could be done to assist with that well our members have fed back and personally with my company during lockdown you know, it was easier to apply for funding in terms of uh, through other um, you know, outlets such as through local councils, through AIM funding. It was a few pages long um, and with time poor, you know, seasonal workers as we are, you know, we work, um, you know, 78 hours a week in the high seasons, which is spring, early summer and uh, autumn, early winter. Um, I know the Arts Council has got music officers in place and I don't really know how that's going to um, how that's going to, um, you know, be translated that, you know, they are there to support people applying, but I'm not sure whether that's to actually look at the application and, and, and assist with that. That's something that will, time, time will tell, but there's certainly hardly any funding bodies we, we can apply to. It's generally the, you know, the usual suspects get the funding and the funding has various requirements on it and when you know your, your regular day-to-day -day work doesn't wash its face to you as a you know way to use a, a term it to mean you know doesn't break even or doesn't make money then um, you know that's your sort of priority um, it's it seems a bit nichey but I'm really hoping this new fund you know quite a few of our members will be able to access because like I say there's hardly even a percentage or two percent that access it from the survey that we did last year for our, for our members. And how do you respond to suggestions that opening this fund to other live music stakeholders may mean that grass mu music venues um, themselves will have to make do with less support? It'd be nice to see a regular pipeline. It'd be nice to see it ring ring fenced. You know, it'd be nice to see some sort of levy that an independent company, a charity, manage and uh, distribute fairly and equally. And Stuart, um, how, if at all, uh, would national promoters be affected if the indie sector isn't able to thrive? Um, well, you, you speak as though we're two separate entities. We're one in the same. Yeah. Uh, we, we work at grassroots level and we take shows through to arenas and stadiums. Um, it's a bit like the football career. Yes, ab ab absolutely, or, albeit we, we move through those artists' careers with them. Um, and so whether, 
whether those artists are, and I'll give a, a couple of personal examples. Uh, my first show I ever did with Simply Red was in a, a club in Manchester in 1985. I still promote them now. Our first show we did with Ed Sheeran was in a club in London. We played to 800 people. The last two tours have sold a million tickets. So you, it, it's wrong to dissociate the two. We bring talent through. and We do hundreds of shows a year at grassroots level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. Thank all of you for coming and giving us evidence today. It's been really, uh, really interesting and useful to hear from you all. You are now you. free, Thank and you. I can invite <laughs> our third panel to come and join us. Thank you very much. Jazz. so much uh, for joining us. We are uh, finally able to welcome our third panel, who are Lily Fontaine, singer-songwriter, vocalist for uh, English teacher whose music was recommended to the committee when we were in Manchester early uh, this year. So you came highly recommended, uh, Lily. Um, Kwame Kwarten, who is the vice chair of the Music Managers Forum, <coughs> and David Martin, the CEO of the Featured Artists Coalition. I should mention... Um, that um, we don't agree on bribery and corruption, but um, the Industry Champion Award um, was given to our committee uh, last year, <laughs> and a couple of the committee did attend that event uh, just as a sort of full disclosure. <coughs> we can be bought. Um, <laughs> um, look, now, you may have noticed that some of my team have already left because uh, we've got competing uh, things that are going on in other parts of Parliament at the moment, including in the Chamber, in which, case, which means Rupa has to fly off very, very shortly to go and ask a justice question. But before she goes, she's going to ask her question. Well, thanks. And Lily, we've all got um, I'm the world's biggest paving slab <laughs> on repeat in our heads at the moment. Yeah. It was in a good way. <laughs> yeah. So, just wanted to ask about diversity of genre of music venues. Would you say, the three of you, I guess, um, and particularly maybe David Martin, but I mean, look, it applies to all of you. Do you think that grassroots music venues programming in the round is fully reflective of the diversity of genres that make up the British music scene. Um, we've heard evidence that um, from people from Radio 1 Extra and stuff that say that despite um, grime, genres like that having a, a large musical footprint, drum, drum and bass, jungle, all those things, there's not enough opportunities to see those live. What do you think? Anyone? I mean, I can't really speak to grime and drum and bass personally. I've, the scene that I operate in is quite separate, but um, I think that the the scene that I operate in, there is the grassroots music scene is, and the venues in the grassroots music scene is the reason why um, it <coughs> operates. It, it would be non-existent without it because it, the type of music that um, is created within the guitar indie uh, sphere is fueled by... Um, local communities and I'm sure yeah exactly you know people are putting it's um you know it's it's people sort of helping out each other in a way and I think I'm guessing that across grime and other genres it's a similar thing um a similar case Mm. uh grime drill definitely suffers I'm just gonna call it out just straight yes definitely does suffer um but I would agree with you as well Grassroots uh, venues lie at the heart, the beating heart of the new development business in music. So, mm. hip hop as well, would you say? Definitely, and yeah. Bhangra, that used to be a thing in my without youth. a doubt, that yeah, absolutely, going? yeah. The Daytona, all that. Abs- I, absolutely. I mean, I, I can talk from experience. I, I currently have ragga for my books so I can I can talk from experience yeah it is it is more difficult brandishing a dagger yeah 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 it is more difficult yes I would I think there's a lack of diversity um, in music genre across the grassroots circuit Um, I think previously it was very difficult to get your recorded music to market 
uh, that has changed with digitization. Actually, now what we see is really hard to get out and tour and perform live for artists. Um, so, you know, we're, we're talking about grime and we're talking about drum and bass. And, but, you know, back to the 60s and, and rock and pop invasion of British music in the US, these countercultural movements come from the grassroots. They come from the underground and they've made the UK the envy of the world musically. So, yes, I would agree that mm. that's a problem if we're not supporting new scenes and new movements. I would, at risk of being controversial, I would say there's one activity that this whole industry is based on, and that is artists performing. And there's one relationship that this whole industry is based on, and that's the relationship between artists and fan. So this should be a grassroots music ecosystem inquiry, not a grassroots music venue inquiry, in my view, because it is important to fuel that activity and to fuel those artists to get out and support the rest of the ecosystem. I like the fan-led football review. There could be a music one that was mentioned by our chair in the last session. OK, and, and even you said from the 60s, R&B meant the who then? R&B means different stuff. These terms are malleable, aren't they? We've always had but, to fight. That's the thing. Yeah. We've always, with new music, we've always had to fight. We have to remember that at one time, the BBC only played 45 minutes of popular music. So there has been huge advances made, but yeah, we, you know, by calling out what we think is wrong, we progress. What are the biggest barriers? How can we get rid of this? So we talked about possibly a fan review, but I mean, realistically, what's going to happen to sort this out? I, I think we need to fund artists. We need to fund activity. Yes, the ecosystem is essential, but it's that activity that drives that ecosystem. That, that relationship is ultimately the product that is sold in the live music industry. That fan-artist relationship is what everybody else is based on. So we need to put, in my view, funding in the hands of artists. They're the tastemakers, they're the music creators, and they're the <coughs> audience developers. So I fully support the rest of the ecosystem being supported and funded, but, but too frequently, artists and music makers are not supported. So you look at the past four years, business rates relief, Culture Recovery Fund, furlough, local authority grants, and now the Grassroots Music Fund, not available to artists. And if they're not available to artists, they're not available to managers. So that sort of incentivization in the post-COVID era, would that help? How I think, it, yeah, I think it was mentioned earlier. I think you look at the talent development programs that are run by charitable organisations. We run a talent development program called Step Up, which is supported by a commercial partner in Amazon Music. The returns on that investment in artist career are evident. You know, we're seeing, we're seeing artists, this year, for example, in Step Up, 62% of the artists that applied have applied for domestic live touring support because they can't make ends meet. They can't make that stack up without that support. So it's very clear to us when you look at, take PRS Foundation, for example, they... they invested £5.2 million in artist development over the last 10 years. That, the return on that was £22 million, just on, that, on their initial um, analysis of that investment, close, close to the time that they invested those funds. So, yeah, absolutely, you've got to fund that activity. And more ideas for incentivisation. And sorry, Lily, would you like to play on more diverse bills with other... Yeah, bills? definitely. I think, um, like, I was just going to say, I can speak to what... To what David was saying, actually, about in um, investing in artists from a real um, personal from pe from personal experience and anecdotal and very recent personal experience, um, because I think that artists at the moment are facing a bit of a crisis in terms of funding. Um, I think that, as you've spoken about in um, in what you're just saying, um, there is a lack of funding for musicians um, to create music. Um, and that is like the foundation of um, where the rest of the ecosystem for the music industry kind of bases on. Because we're like, I guess, the business owners, right? In, in a sense, we're employing everybody else. Um, I've got a list actually in here. Mm -hmm. um, of, <laughs> Take it away. Uh, list. Of people that Take we employ. Time. So we've got tour managers, sound engineers, van hire, equipment hire. Musicians, non-artist fees, driver fees, accommodation, travel, petrol, ferries, carne. This is if you're going abroad. 
um, insurance, equipment, health insurance, rehearsal spaces, instruments, upkeep, food and drink, phot photography fees, uh, and then I've got etc. But what's on top? <laughs> um, and what basically what I'm saying is that um, to maintain a level of professionalism in this industry, you have to have all of those things in place. Um, and then to be able to fund that, there isn't really any money coming in to fund that. Um, you get record labels that give you an advance that has to be split between a number of people. Um, and <coughs> so at the end of the day, you're left with zero profit. Um, so that I think that what, what David was saying is right, is that if you can't support artists at this level who are signed to major labels, um, and then you can't support artists at a lower level, um, then how <coughs> is anyone who doesn't have money or anyone who is from a regional area where they don't have access to venues going to um, have an opportunity to um, create music and to tour music? And that leads to homogeny within the music industry, which um, then leads to less diverse music scenes. And if there's less diverse music scenes, then that means that our, one of our biggest exports, which is music in this country, is then um, diminished, yeah. And if that suffers, then I think that the knock-on effect of that, because um, you know this this country like is very well known within not just the continent but the world for its export creatively, um, but specifically music. You know the Beatles, like the list can go on and on. And I'm not going to go through them all, but I think that if you don't, if we don't tackle this now, then the knock-on effect of that could be incredibly severe. Um, I think, and also to Totally, I totally back everything that you've just said, Lily. I'd also say, just to get this right out there, this Grass Music Arena Levy, or Gmail, or if you can't remember it, just think of Archie Gemmel, Gemmel, <laughs> who scored a great goal, by the way, from Scotland. But that's another story. But what I would say is this. That's a great initiative. Some, you know, people adding a pound to a ticket, that going into a fund being able to be accessed by grassroots venues, but we also support it being able to be accessed by artists and managers. And when we say artists and managers, we say it from a management standpoint because even if you look at the Brits recently, where we are now, we've moved very much from what was major label culture into independent culture. So. Ray is an independent artist. Stormzy started out and was playing Glastonbury as an independent artist. Skepta is an independent artist. These are independent artists that are earning this country millions. Not even straight millions, tens of millions of pounds and feeding it back in through tax. Okay? So, yeah, we do support that. And this whole thing about supporting the, the level of one person in a show up to a thousand, it's absolutely crucial because you don't get to playing, Ed Sheeran playing two shows last year at the O2 unless he played the Bedford in Ballam, unless he played the Queen of Hoxton with I Love Live promoting, or Jesse J playing the Pigal in Leicester Square, or Seal playing Pig in Holborn to 75 people. You don't reach that mm. without investment at this level. We all know who those performers and people are, but unless artists and managers are supported from zero to a thousand people venues, you won't reach that level. And to back what you said, I also have something written here. You've got the artist and the manager, sure, sat there. You've got the tour manager, legal contract, accountant, agent, promoter, venue, roadie, front of house, drink manufacturers that all rely on people. But you've also got hotels, restaurants, pubs, local chippies, high street food markets, transport services, local media, local businesses, small brands, writers of songs, producers, graphic designers, performers, and indie... I mean, it's huge. And we've already, we've already worked out that a thousand, a thousand people entering a venue equals one million pounds in local business. So it's, it's essential. 
Brilliant, thanks. I think some of these were treading on some of my colleagues' questions, but thank you ever so much. <laughs> I'm going to run off because the speaker will go mad otherwise, but really grateful for all that. And, and thanks for asking the question, stuff. seriously. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Rupert. Um, <coughs> Lily, can I turn to you? You, you and your bandmates have spoken about the value of um, the importance, the value of grassroots music venues in in your career and in the ability to sort of hone your craft. Um, can you just sort of flesh that out for me a little bit? Sort of talk about what you know, what value it's added to you in, in developing your 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 you know your style and and your skills, uh, but also whether you've seen any impact from the fact that those venues are now beginning to close. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it kind of, it all began in grassroots venues for me um, and for the other members of the band. So I grew up in a region that isn't um, in one of the main cities. So I grew up um, just outside of Burnley in a place called Colne. These, this town um, could do with more financial investment, but one of the great things about it is it had these music venues, um, which aside from the fact that it provided me a place to develop my career, um, it also provides um, an artistic community um, which is important um, aside from people being able to build a career it's important for people to have access to the arts and there was there is um, a sort of there is there is a money being made within the town because of that because of um, people spending money in the bars when they're going to watch local bands and whatnot so even <coughs> though it's not at a big level so um, but also it provided a space for me to develop as a musician, learn how to be bad at it before learning how to be okay at it, um, and develop confidence. Um, I started performing for money, which made me realise that it's a potential career, ended up going to university, um, and then when I went to Leeds to study music, um, it was the Leeds music venues that then <coughs> sort of took me under their wing in the same way that those first venues did. Um, so it started out with um, venues that are run by local musicians, you know, someone doing the sound for free on the evening. As much of the music industry is is currently run under free labour, which I have a massive problem with. But um, well, it the make sense. yeah, that's it's the, that's the crazy thing. It's, it? Yeah, it's 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 hard. Um, but so those music, those those grassroots venues are very important to the scene because. Um, everything's connected. So, for example, there's a service in Leeds called Music Leeds, or it's called Music Local now, it was called Music Leeds, and they provide advice to artists, and we sort of joined that, and they were very close with um, a music venue called Breedon Social Club that started putting on some of our very first shows, um, who I'm sure some of you guys are aware of. Um, they th does amazing work um, supporting grassroots venues through them. Um, but... The, what happened for us, one of the, the key things that happened and one of the most vital things that I think is important to mention is that through the knowledge that we gained from Nath, who runs that venue, and through the people that we met whilst attending that venue, whereas attending shows, speaking to people, networking, we found out about a grant from PPL that allowed us to um, record our very first <coughs> single. Um, without that, that money, we probably wouldn't have been able to record that single. Um, and without recording that single, we now we probably wouldn't have signed to the label that we signed to, which then led us on to starting essentially our own business because now four of us are four young people in a partnership um, as self-employed musicians, um, employing the list of people that I explained before. So everything is connected. Um, you've got the grassroots venues are important because it brings like joy and um, creativity to communities that need it because um, without it it would be great and um, and also there is there is a local ecosystem there financially but also they're in, they're vital for training up people who are then going to become employers of other um, contractors within the music industry Thank you very much, Lily. Um, David, can I move on to you? You wrote to the NME saying that there's been a cost of touring crisis, mm. uh, and that's 
really f about artists, which is you know what we've already heard from all three of you. The key to this is is artists. Um, they are the live sector's biggest employers, and as you've already articulated, you know the whole uh, the architecture of the you know the whole sector depends upon them. What's the root cause of this crisis? Um, there are a number of things. Um, we've got we've got rising costs, which impact artists in two ways because. It, it's the first thing that fans stop spending on is, is potentially going out and, and leisure. And then the supply chain is very expensive. Lily just, just um, outlined some of the things that artists pay for. And Anna mentioned earlier about, about uh, promoters being risk takers. But actually, the artist might take a fee away, but, but they're paying lots of people from that. And those costs have all gone up. I mean, one of, one of the artists that we work very closely with at the FAC at the moment has talked about losing her... her um, session musicians three times so she's had to reform the band three times and has eventually given up because the costs have be become so high so you add transport you add um, accommodation you, you add the fact that everybody's day rate is increasing to the fact that you've got a potential compression in the demand for tickets that that is having an impact and then I, I would say that that actually we, do, we don't fund the arts fantastically well in this country. I think that looking at the, the expenditure from Arts Council England, for example, not enough of it goes to commercial music. It's very, just somebody else mentioned earlier, how burdensome it is to apply. It's very burdensome for artists who are, who are surviving on a shoestring. So there are a number of areas that, that are impacting on artists' ability to tour at the moment. And then this is also being compounded by the fact that Post Brexit, it's more difficult for early stage bands to get out and tour. We're seeing below the very top level, we're seeing something like a 74% 70, decline in those artists that are getting out to tour versus pre pandemic in Europe. So, all of those things are having a knock on effect. And that's why when we talk about the ecosystem, I, I, when I, I'm quite forceful about the artist argument, as you would expect me to be, but I fully agree that this is an ecosystem. However, I often feel that the artist and the creators are left out of that argument. I feel like, thanks to Mark and to MBT, everybody knows about the crisis in grassroots music venues. I don't know that everybody understands the sort of the delicate balance that's going on behind the scenes in other parts of the sector. Mm. So as part of your work, you've been calling for a root and branch reform what would that what would that look like in an ideal world and how would that be structured in the sense of how much of it would be industry led would there be a role for government you know what would you be expecting our committee to be advocating for yeah. in, in, the, in your sort of dream scenario well we've long advocated for a uk music strategy which i mean we since i've been in post we've we've called for that which includes a credible export strategy first of all so it certainly would want government to be involved in that um, obviously, we're having the discussion about the levy, and, and it's a relatively complex topic. There's a number of ways that it could be Im implemented. Um, government has a role to play there, potentially. I would say that on the levy, whilst we're potentially supportive, it would need to be on top of the ticket fee. It can't be a downward pressure on artists or a voluntary thing, where you have some artists, potentially British artists, saying, yes, we're very happy with the levy, and then you've got foreign artists coming to the UK saying, we're not prepared to do this. It creates an uneven playing field. But I think there's a role there to play in, in guiding discussions on a levy uh, and potentially, I mean, we're involved in the streaming inquiry. We know that what this committee what this committee recommends is very important, but we know how challenging it can be to implement those recommendations. But I think with the right will, government could really help the industry coalesce about how a levy would be collected and distributed. Um, earlier you heard about PRS um, and the black box revenues. We don't think it's right that, that black box revenues flow to the largest rights holders and the largest um, songwriters. We think that should go towards funding grassroots music and particularly grassroots touring. Um, on the streaming inquiry, I think there's, there's something to be said there for, for actually seeing this committee's recommendations implemented, which we are still working on with government. But, but ensuring that artists get a fair deal from streaming will be really important to their overall income. Um, and I think that the way that Arts Council operates, I think, needs to, needs to be looked at. Um, we are supportive of Arts Council, but I think that sometimes the processes are too burdensome. And then I think more generally, 
it's taken a very long time for us to be at the table on this conversation. So I, I think music makers and artists being at the center of discussions is essential. We sit as a member of Live and we sit as a member of UK Music, which is great. We, we, we push our voice forward in that way. But too often conversations happen without artists, songwriters and other music makers at the table. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Giles. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to be very brief. Fundamentally, because Kwame and Lily uh, had a list that I've got, and I was going to go through that uh, and um, <coughs> ask about the uh, support structure for artists. But first of all, uh, on top of what you were saying, Kwame, because my background is performing arts, uh, theatre, etc., and, and, and I ran a couple of theatres and things, and I do understand the soft power that we have Absolutely. in our performing arts. Yeah. Um, more than the hundreds of millions that you were talking about, mm. it is also UK PLC <laughs> out there, show us what we can do and puts us on the map. Okay. Really important. Yeah. So I wanted to make that comment before I started really because um, I really haven't got much to ask because you've answered the questions. Um, fundamentally, the support <laughs> structure around uh, artists, the, the technicians, managers, agents, etc. We saw in theatre, and I know it terribly well, a, a, a talent drain. People just <coughs> went away from the industry entirely thanks to the pandemic yeah. because it was shut down. Theatre was you know, the, the, the first to close and the last to open because of the very nature. And the same applies to music venues. Um, is, is there a story there from the manager? This is to you, Kwame. Yeah. Is there a story there that, that, that it is recovering, that, that support structure is there for artists like Lily to use, because they need to be creative, they need to be free to do that, and in order to do that, they need guys like you. Is it recovering? Are there people there to support them? <coughs> no. At, at the top end, okay, this is the, this is, you, it, earlier on you said something that was very, very true, all of you were saying something that was very true. This thing about sometimes statistics can get skewed by the earnings at the top end. Yeah. Right? So, on the face of it, you look at it, you look at all the reports, 9% growth, <coughs> you know, with regards to music, um, touring, doing really, really well, etc. We're not talking about it. We're, we're the area that we really, we're saying grassroots, we're saying from one person to a thousand is where, it, is what needs real concentration because we can't get to the stars of tomorrow. We can't get to Seal. We can't get to Central Sea. We can't get to, we can't get to Skepta. We can't get to Stormzy without them playing in those small venues. And the problem that we've got, quite simply, and all of this for me is in real time, okay? I'm a manager. I'm a manager, for instance, of an act called Blue Lab, who have an, Blue Lab Beats, who have an album coming out in April, who have a tour, a small record store tour to do. These things, as you know, back in the day were standard. Mm. You know, people would go to every record store, signings would happen, queues around the block, all of that. Everybody remembers it. That record store tour is having to be, at, right now, stands at a deficit of £2,394, mm. which will be placed squarely at the foot of the artist and manager, right? And that's with a tiny bit of record company assistance, so I'm not even sitting here booting them. I'm saying with a tiny bit of record company assistance in there still, that's where we are, all right? With regards to live shows, I look after Hack Baker as well. Hack Baker toured in Germany, okay? We came back from a four or five day tour in, in Germany, again, with a loss of something like 3,000 pounds. It's because the artist cares and says, do you know what? I want to reach those markets that this is happening. So- Could they be described Kwame, as, as lost leaders then to do that? Yeah, but the problem is, how long... Hack, you're talking about a seven-year journey. Yeah, so you won't recover in that period of time. Seven-year journey to reach there. Fair enough, he's going to be playing Somerset House. That's not a plug, but he is going to be playing Somerset House. But, but, mm -hmm. that's a seven- to eight-year journey. And some of the people that you're seeing now, let's face it, Ray picked up all of those Brit Awards the other night. Great, ten years. Yeah. 
Yeah? That's what we're talking about. So we're, and, and, and we're saying all this knowing that if at the top end, a thousand people go to a show in Manchester, one million pounds will be made. It's staring us in the face. It's the easiest quick win. Invest. Yeah. And we are back to, to yeah. VAT as well. Absolutely. That. With that, we totally, that, the VAT cut for small <coughs> venues, absolutely essential. I cannot, I cannot stress how important it is. Before Thank coming you. here, I spoke to many small venues. Can I just ask you one, one, one question, because it, it, time's running away with this. Um, do you have to manage the expectations amongst artists as, as they uh, come to touring? Manage disappointment is what I manage. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, totally. Because they have a fixed thing in their head. Don't forget, they've grown up through the ages, like you and like me, seeing great bands being made and great acts being made from touring, touring, touring. The UK has made its <coughs> reputation from this. And we now have this, as you say, this drain at the bottom end that is seriously crippling our forward-thinking business. And it has to be addressed. It's got to be addressed now. Brilliant. You make a very impassioned thing. I'll just say one more thing before I go. Good luck with your album. This could be Texas. It is, yes. This Coming out. Okay. Thank, Thank you. <laughs> You've got a whole new fan base here. <laughs> You're welcome. You may not have expected it, but here you are. <laughs> You're going to have to live with it. Um, Damien. Um, and and on, I was going to plug the album as well, so I thought you know, we should do it in return for your turning up here. But you know, you've been going, what, three, four years at the with band? this band, yeah. yeah, yeah. About four years. And <clears throat> your first album is coming out next month. Are you anywhere near making money yet? No. No. <laughs> um, in real terms, we haven't. We we don't expect to make any profit um, and how long from our going? tours. So, as a band, we've been going for let's see, I think four, around four years now. Um, we are. We don't really. We, we're currently we are working as artists. Um, over, uh, I'd say probably over 40 hours a week. We're working at full time, but we are earning less than minimum wage, um, which I personally don't think is, well, it's not legal, but it's the way that the industry works. It's the way that um, we are, it is now for us. Um, so we don't, we don't earn um, any money from touring, um, or if we do, it's a tiny amount, and it's because our label has chucked us some money to make things even. And then we earn a little bit from um, selling merch, um, which again, once we move up to bigger venues, that can then be diminished through the um, the cuts that's taken from venues like um, the bigger capacity venues. Um, and the problem with this is, and the, the pro in a sort of an anecdotal sense, personal sense, um, the problem for us was that we weren't able to afford things like rent bills. Um, I was sofa surfing whilst writing the first album, um, while signed to a major label um, with a full team. Um, and that is hard because I'm a 26 year old person. So it's disappointing for me mm. to have worked on my career so long and to be struggling in that sense. Mm. Um, but then it's also hard to work on the creativity. Um, you can't focus on writing music if you're trying to get by every day. Um, so there's that. Um, I think that I think that's why it's important to just taking it back to the levy and to um, whatever relief is provided. I think that's why it's important that it is spoken about in terms of artists as well. As uh, and, and, and do you have? I'll, I'll, I'll ask you this. I, I think Kwame's already answered this, but um, there, there are sort of two models. So there's a sort of voluntary model, mm -hmm. and 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 there's a compulsory model, possibly yeah. a statutory model. Which one of those would you go for? I'm very much, I think, especially after listening to everything that's spoken about today, um, I think that the compulsory model seems more appropriate. Um, I think that it's, it's not very often that conversations like this are put to artists. Um, it's not um, a secret, I think, within the industry that artists aren't always consulted, they aren't always brought into the room when it's topics about money or about... Um, um, 
things that like relate to the business side of the industry um, and I think that um, it would then then trying to um, put it down to each individual artist for some for this could make that um, fund unsustainable um, because it would fluctuate um, depending on how much the artist knows about it, about the um, the levy um, so I think that if we are going to bring this in I think that it needs to be something that is sustainable so people can prepare and distribute it um, fairly yeah thank you I mean, do you, you, you want the compulsory levy, do you? 100%. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, without a doubt. Um, we all know, you know, if you give, if you give uh, people the chance to back away from paying sometimes, they'll take it. Not everybody is as generous as enter Shikari, <laughs> right? So let's, let's put that out there. Um, I would say... I back your point with regards to the fact that artists and managers are often not in the room and the MMF obviously stands uh, proudly with regards to that point, the fact that it is really, really important that when these discussions are happening, that artists and managers are in the room. Because it's, you know, you're depending on us to bring that iceberg of business into towns and, and, and make everything happen. And we all know what happens. Look, I'm sat there and I'm sat there with a tour schedule, right? My tour schedule before would have gone to Newcastle, would have gone to Stockport, would have gone to Southampton, would have gone to Cam Cornwall, would have gone to Bradford. Now, my tour schedule goes to London, it goes to Manchester, it goes to Liverpool, it might go to Glasgow, maybe Dublin. Maybe. Yeah. Right? And there is no surprise that in those towns we are complaining about one thing, which is the high streets looking empty. It is that serious. Yeah. Yeah, that, although I'm, I'm slightly worried that having remembered Archie Gemmell's goal that we're both showing our age here. That was a 1978 World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> I watch mine on YouTube. Just oh, <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, look, I, I fully support a fan-led review. And, and beyond that, I, I think we should ask fans whether they would pay a levy. But I do think it needs to be on top of the ticket. I think as soon as it is voluntary, there is the opportunity to opt out. There is the opportunity to create a, an imbalance in the playing field. And it's great what, what has already happened on a voluntary level before, but as soon as that, that funding is inside the ticket, you, it, it is quite complex. There's the promoter split, there's the artist fee, the, there's other elements that are rolled into there and it becomes quite complex. And, and my view is always that it will get negotiated out at the artist's end, if that is placed. It, it, one pound going in within the ticket price won't end up as one pound coming out as a levy. It will be negotiated out of the artist's fee, in my, in my view. So, yeah, I think... It needs to be additional, clear. Correct. And, and we're already, just to back that up, we're already stating, as I said earlier, with the Hack Baker touring in Germany, that 2,659 pounds is from his money. Because from his heart, he chooses to spread his music that way. Thank you. And last but not least, Clive. Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, before I come to my questions about uh, uh, merchandise, uh, uh, I just really struck by just uh, we're talking about grassroots uh, venues. Right? By their very nature, there's not a lot of revenue flowing around in that area of the, yeah. uh, of the industry. We've heard from Lily about how you know uh, talented artists struggle, and you know you were <coughs> mentioned sofa surfing. What, how does a, 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 an up-and-coming artist at that level of the industry afford the essential, it seems, support of people like yourselves you know, in promoting and managing uh, artists at that level when, when there is so little revenue around? How, I mean, how does that work? Are there many that fall by the wayside because they don't get that sort of support? Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah. You know, it's already a very com competitive industry. Um, so, yes, there are lots. But to, to give you one sort of stat, that we have our own talent development program and other parts of the sector, like PRS Foundation and Help Musicians, 
uh, they see applications, they're able to award applications in the region of about 5% of what they see from, from artists um, for talent development. So you can see the demand is huge um, and you can see that lots of people are unsuccessful in that. Um, I, I think I mean, there's two points in your question there. I think the first point was about merchandise. I was going to come to merchandise. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry. Well, yeah, yes is the answer to your yeah. question. Yes, we see lots of artists fall by the wayside. Yes, it's already very challenging, but we need to stop looking at investment in artists as being a cost. The UK's music industry contributed £5.8 billion in GVA in 2019. In, in 2022, that was up to £6.7 billion. That was 15.5% 15, 15 increase. But that funding to artists, we've already made the point that, that artists and the fan relationship is the product. That funding is not a cost. It's an investment in artists. It's an investment in the industry and it's an investment in the UK public purse. Yeah, it just struck me that listening to the evidence today that we're looking into you know, the finances and support around uh, grassroots venues, but in order to make the best of those venues, there's more that needs to be supported. Yeah, yeah, yeah th so th thanks for that. But, but uh, yes, yeah, so the, when we had our round tables, um, the uh, uh, grassroots venues were, were, were supportive of the 100% venues campaign. Um, uh, 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 but uh, uh, what can you? I mean, how essential is that 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 uh, um, the success of that to the artists that are that we've just been discussing? You know, how, uh, what proportion of their uh, income comes from merchandise rather than tickets and other other things? Yeah, yeah go on, Mark, David. I, I can. One thing I should say is we've seen the Academy Music Group. Finally, last year, drop its merchandise commission from 25% plus VAT down to 15% plus VAT. It was a huge, huge impact for artists. But just to highlight the point that you make, examples of two tours. One of the tours was six shows across, Ger across Germany. The merchandise income for that artist was double the show fee. And it meant that rather than having a £500 loss, that artist paid their rent for three months as a result of the merchandise income. And secondly, in the UK, 13 shows across the UK, Without merch sales, the show would have made about £200 profit, despite the artist being very frugal. As a result, it made 10 times that. So you can see how important that merchandise is, potentially to artists at that level, and how big a deal is for they're losing 25% plus fat, it is, um, on, on their bottom line, <coughs> effectively. And we've called for, for four additional things for those, for those venues that can't get to 0% commission, because we, we're not asking venues to be out of pocket with the 100% venues campaign. We're saying we want to end punitive fees. And we're asking for four things for those that aren't getting to 0%. That's that support acts are never charged the commission, that artists are offered the option to staff and operate merchandise operations themselves, that there are no surprises with terms fully understood and agreed in advance, and that terms must always be open to negotiation, so an end to cartel fees cartel-like fee-setting behaviour when it comes to merchandise commission. And so, uh, uh, what, what's the way forward in terms of, uh, I mean, are, are um, you know, is there cooperation with the, with the campaign? Are there sections of the industry yeah. that are, are, are not? And, you know, if, if so, how do we overcome that? Music Venues Trust and Independent Venue Week have been very supportive, have really backed the campaign doesn't mean all of the members have, uh, have signed up yet, but, but the, the organisations have been very supportive. As I mentioned, the Academy Music Group have come on board, so that level of venue from sort of 1,000 up to 3,000, 5,000 in, in Brixton have reduced their fees. We'd like to see them take on those four other points, but beyond that level, the still support <coughs> acts playing at venues the size of O2 who are facing Merchandise Commission. That, that can't be right. We've just heard how challenging it is to develop your career at that level. That can't be right. So we would like to see the larger venues move on this sort of rigid 25% plus VAT down, that needs to come down. Yeah. And secondly, we'd like everybody to adopt those four principles. And how, just, just so you understand, how, how does the, uh, the rigid 15% apply? Is it, is it the venues themselves that decide on that level? Yes. So they, yeah, they, they, they've agreed across the board yeah. that... That, 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 that level of, uh, of commission. Um, so, and are there other costs that venues do bear that, that should be considered when deciding whether um, um, that there should be a, 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 you know, a, a proportion of merchandise paid, paid to the venue? Well, as I say, we're, we're, not, we're not against venues. If venues face a cost for delivering a merchandise function, 
that we're not against that cost being paid. What we're against is punitive fees being placed on, on artists. So the idea that, that an artist who is a support act, 25% plus VAT commission, is supporting the cost of that merchandising function, it, it just doesn't stack up in many cases. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Clive. Well, that brings us to the end. Can I just thank everybody that's taken part today? We normally, just to sort of a bit of an explainer, we normally just do two sessions within our, our one morning meeting. And today, because we heard so much um, evidence from the venues that we met in our, um, uh, our roundtables, uh, we just wanted to kind of expand that and bring in three whole panels worth of um, worth of witnesses and experts today, which is uh, normally, you know, quite a typical challenge, and that's why we've seen people coming and going. Um, but I wanted to thank you all for taking part and leaning into this so brilliantly. Um, what's going to happen next is that we will be, provi- the, the committee will be pulling together a, a written report on everything that we've heard, making recommendations, and, um, and hopefully answering some of the uh, really, really valid suggestions and, and um, recommendations that you guys have uh, have made with us today. So we're just really massively grateful to uh, all those who've taken part. Thank you. Order, order. Thank you. Thank you. Proceeding has ended. The 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 proceeding has ended.